and we are honored to have you join us here on Note Weekend. This is our one-day class. It's kind of the Cliff Notes version of Note Investing. We'll go through how to find fun and flip kind of the high points of it. Uh, you're not going to learn everything you need to know about Note Investing in a four- to five-hour class, but it's a good kind of stick your toes in the water, see if this is something that you think you might be interested in if you like the concept, like the theory, or heck, just like me. You know, I might not be your cup of tea, and that's a okay. I don't take offense to that. I sleep fine at night. But <laughs> we're honored to have you guys join us here. Um, expecting quite a good crowd today. Um, probably over, I don't know, 30 people, I guess, is uh, 30, 40 people opted in today uh, for today's one-day class. And if you can't join us the entire time, don't worry about it. We'll get you the replays. It's email that out to you with a manual and stuff like that that you can kind of take a look at to kind of look at some stuff. But I focus on one specific niche. And how did I get into that specific niche? I'll share my backstory before we get rocking and rolling here. Thank you. Thank you for some fresh, warm coffee. We're going to take, uh, just so you guys know, people ask me, oh, are you going to go straight through? And here's the time frame. You'll be done in time probably to catch the playoff game today. If you're watching the NFL, we'll probably wrap up around somewhere two, uh, two to three. So it's about a four to five hour class. I know. Uh, some of you like that, some of you like, oh, can you just get through everything in an hour? <laughs> but um, no, it, it takes a little bit longer. We will take some breaks throughout um, so that you can hit the bio, get you a fresh cup of coffee, water, something to nibble on. We're not taking a lunch break. We'll probably just take a quick you know, midday 15-minute break and then rock and roll on through for you. But we've got this kind of thing structured in three different phases. The, the fine side, I'll talk about what we're finding, what we're looking for. The funding side, and then kind of the, the flip side, how we make money, the different exit strategies and stuff like that. And look, I get, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to ask questions. I'm a big proponent that there are no dumb questions out there. You have to ask questions to understand things because this is not something everybody's going to know. And I have enabled the chat role for you guys to be able to ask questions amongst yourselves and, and to me. If you are watching this on the YouTube live stream, yes, we are live streaming it. Why would I do that? Because I just want to get the word out and note investing. I'm very passionate about buying and investing in distressed debt or banknotes. I had a great conversation with a guy yesterday who uh, was talking about, oh, going out and finding deals and creating notes and originating them and then selling those notes. Um, and I, I had to kind of correct him a little bit because that's a, that's, there's, that's not, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with it. You could go out and find tired landlords or people that can't sell their house and maybe they'd be willing to owner finance it to you. But here's the thing about that is you're going to need to hold on to that paper probably at least a year. And that's called seasoning. Hold on for at least a year to get a the premium price on it. And you're still maybe going to take a little bit of a discount. So I'm a bigger proponent. And this is just, I don't know if it was, I was lucky to stumble into this years ago with my, where I was at the time and maybe smart enough to figure, hey, this is something I should focus on. You've heard the riches are in the niches and, and no real estate investor who is a jack of all trades is going to master any of them. And unfortunately, I see this happening over and over and over and over again. Now, there's nothing wrong with education. I will tell you, it is good to be uh, to learn all different aspects of real estate investing so you're knowledgeable. In the Look, I've taken hundreds of classes, thousands of hours of training and workshops for 20 years, I still educate myself. I still get up and go to workshops. I went last year to a couple day workshop in Houston on, on capital raising. I'm going constantly to marketing conferences to learn how to better get my stuff out there. I'm actually hosting master classes from, from some of the experts that I admire. Like we had a master class with Chris Prefontaine from Wicked Smart talking about uh, buying on terms, buying on terms, not selling terms, but buying on terms and subject to deals because those are opportunities in today's market. We had Aaron Young from uh, Laughlin Associates. We had a master class with him on uh, uh, asset protection, which is one of the most important things you have. We've got an upcoming master class with Cindy Spearlin on tax lien investing here in the next two weeks. We've got another master class with Catherine Pomeritz on uh, taxes and bookkeeping. It can be very powerful for you. And then we've also got another master class. I know I'm on oh, due diligence from Dickie Baldwin, uh, from Baldwin Advisory Group on the different things. So I treat my podcast and treat a lot of the things that I do with my interests. But I also listen to what you ask me, what you watch, what you listen to my podcast. If you aren't listening to the Note Closure Show podcast, I highly encourage you to do that. If you're watching on YouTube, hey, make sure you subscribe by hitting 
the subscribe button or going to weeklosenotes.tv to uh, help us make continue to be the number one YouTube channel out there. But we're also the number one podcast. So when I get questions and comments or I see what people watch, particularly with downloads and what people take an interest in, I want to add more of that to you guys because I know those are questions that you want to have covered. And I encourage you to reach out to me, ask questions throughout the weekend or throughout today's um, webinar, you see down here at my name, right? Where you, most people say their name. Well, I put talkwithscottcarson.com for one reason. You guys know my name, Scott Carson, hopefully, the note guy. Been note investing for almost actually 20 years. I've been a real estate investor for over 20 years. I, I just realized that. Wow. Yeah. 20, over 20. Oh, wow. It's 24, 24. So it's coming up on my 26 year quarter century as a real estate investor. Wow. I know I look good for my age, don't I? <laughs> so I wear my cap to cover all my gray hair. But anyway, <laughs> I need to go get a haircut tomorrow anyway, because it's getting a little shaggy in the sides here. But anyway, part of what I got into, I a previous mortgage broker, mortgage banker, bought my first house, still flat. You know, we bought our house out of college, it's making good money, bought two more investment properties because we could finance and the realtor's like, hey, it's a great time for you to be buying real estate. You could probably get in with nothing down. And that's exactly what we did. We basically bought our primary residence was like four grand out of pocket, but our two investment properties, we were actually able to get 100% finance, 280 20 loans. Well, we were going to be the, I was going to be the next landlord. I grew up in a, a small town down in South Texas called Ingleside. I'm just an Ingle Dink from Ingleside. Uh, uh, well, that's fine. Somebody said National Property Solutions, no problem. We, If you email me at scott at weclosenotes.com, we'll make sure. And uh, get that corrected and get it over to you. All right. Thanks for, for thanks for coming. Let me know that NPR or N, NPS. Um, appreciate it. The great, uh, yeah. But I uh, started as a mortgage broker with a buddy of mine back in 2004. I did some other things out of college, but um, where was it? Oh, anyway, like I said, I was an Ingle Dink from Ingleside. And uh, I, you know, grew up in a hardware store. I could fix things. I mean, I was cracking up because I was walking around my neighborhood this weekend with a freeze. We had a few folks who had pipes burst right in their garage. I was like, oh, I could fix that. Doesn't mean I want to be a plumber. I'm not going to be a plumber. But if I needed to, I could fix that myself in like five minutes um, if it happened to me. So, but that's what I thought. I said, hey, I'll have a couple of rental properties. We want to do that. You know, I'd read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We were a big fan of Flip This House, that fictional TV show on TV. And then I lost my job. And then my tenants lost their jobs. And we were a distressed borrower. So I think God puts us in situations because he's He's planning us for something in the future. And I'm really believe in my faith that uh, he doesn't give us anything. He or she doesn't give us anything that we can't and control or can't handle. We might be stretched a little bit. And you might have to go through hell sometimes, but he doesn't give us anything that we can't handle. Firm believer in that. So, uh, Got my asses out of the sling. It got me into banking. I did that for a while. I was really good as a, as a banker for JP Morgan Chase, one of the top bankers in the state. But I always wanted to get that entrepreneurial bug. And so when my buddy Boyd came to me and started a was starting a mortgage company with a guy named Bob Leonetti and a lady named Jamie Kayla, I saw it as an opportunity to really learn the right way. And so I left, uh, uh, left the more it left the uh, the banking business and got into real estate investing with Boyd and uh, we, he did that for four years and then was fortunate enough to learn so much from Bob and Jamie over that four year real apprenticeship. While we were originating loans, we were also doing a lot of creative financing. I did my first 72 deals. I bought my first non-performing note. I learned how to invest properly, was doing fix and flips, learned all that stuff the right way so that when everything hit the fan in 2008, <clears throat> I was ready to make the leap as a full-time note investor. And that's really what I did. And, uh, Flash forward now, it's hard to believe 2008, that's golly, 16 years as a, since I've been full-time, just as, as a pure note investor anyway, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and bought over a billion dollars in debt, residential, commercial, just a lot of great stuff out there that we bought. We've been able to keep a lot of folks in homes, made a lot of money for ourselves, a lot of money for our investors. I mean, we have, we've had ups and downs just like anybody else. Some deals have been great. Other deals have kicked us in the teeth, you know. The, the idea here is you keep failing forward in a lot of cases. I'm failing, no, but there are times you're like, oh, I got to get rid of this deal or this deal is killing me or whatever like that. But you're not going to be perfect. If you are waiting around for the perfect deal, you might as well go keep your job because investing, we know there's always 
twists and turns to every deal you dive into. So today's class is designed for those of you who are interested in note investing, have heard about it, but maybe don't know more about it, or maybe you heard it combined with another a creative financing class or a buying on terms class, but don't spend a bunch of time on that. My focus on this is to buy non-performing notes. That's where we see the most amount of opportunity. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be the most uh, seasoned investor. You don't have to have a lot of uh, experience in fix and flip. I mean, don't get me wrong, all that stuff helps, but it also can hamper you when you're bidding on assets. You've got to think like a bank. And that's what one of the biggest things I want you to think about today is think like a bank, right? And when you buy a note, you're not buying it as a property. Okay, you're buying the note. You are entitled to the note and you have the right to that property if you foreclose or the borrower deeds it back to you. But you're really, the thing you've got to keep in mind too with that is you're owed what you're owed and really that's it unless nobody buys at the auction. All right, and we'll get that later on for you. But like I said, there's no dumb questions on here. If you've got a, a burning desire or something, feel free to type in the chat roll. I'd love to know where you guys are tuning in from. I know some of you guys, uh, I recognize your guys' names. I see uh, Jim's there. You go, buddy. Good to see you. Um, a few others out there. Lisa from Detroit. Matrice from uh, Atlanta. Who else is on here? Sam, we talked yesterday, the day before. Hey, Cartez. Good to see you. Daryl, John. Um, Arizona, Phoenix. That's right, Sam. And then uh, we got a few folks joining us live on YouTube. So anyway. Let's dive into kind of the basics of note investing. When I'm talking about a note, I'm not talking about buying the actual property. Let's get that straight, okay? We are talking about buying the mortgage debt. Now, if you've ever owned a house and had a mortgage taken out or refinanced a few years back, <clears throat> you probably got a letter about a month, two, two months later, or maybe a year later, who knows, that your mortgage has, has been sold, right? It used to pay like Citizens Bank, and now it's Chase Bank, or it used to pay Wells Fargo Bank. And now it's uh, HBSC, it, you know, very common. Well, what happened there is that existing lender that you had the loan with sold your loan, whether it's individually or in a portfolio, sold it to another institution. Okay. Your debt didn't change. What you owe, you still owe. You just now make your checkout or make your payments out to a different bank, right? And the new bank may have acquired that note by paying either a premium or if you were a little, little naughty note uh, borrower and weren't paying on time, they may have bought that note at a discount from the existing bank. Didn't stop what you owed, but you still owe that amount. You're just paying a different individual. You probably, if you stop paying for a little while, if you've ever been late in your mortgage or lost your job or gone through a country western song in real life, uh, you've probably gotten a phone call from a bank or a servicing company, stuff like that. Hey, let's get you back on track. Let's have you start making your mortgage payment on time, right? So that, that that's basically what we do. We are buying debt, whether it's a one-off note or a portfolio of notes. And since we're buying non-performing stuff, we're buying stuff usually at a sizable discount that gives us the opportunity to collect on that debt or foreclose on that asset for what we're owed on. And the difference in what we pay versus what's owed, that's where we make our profit by either A, getting the borrower back on track or B, taking the asset back. Or in some cases, giving cash to the borrower or letting them walk away scot-free without having a foreclosure on the record, okay? I know, uh, no, you don't own the property. When you buy the mortgage, you're becoming the bank. So that's why I want you to think of it as a bank. You're not a fix and flipper. You're not a landlord. You're not a property owner. You're owning the debt. You're the lien holder, okay? Now, a lot of people think of note investing as when they have a house and they sell it on terms. You're technically becoming the bank. That's correct. You are selling on terms. We're not selling on terms. We're buying the existing terms already in place and just stepping into the bank's shoes. Instead of it being listed in the county records as uh, HSBC Bank, it's now Scott, you know, Bank of Scott Carson. It's Bank of Cartes Daniels, the Bank of Jim Shibley, all right, the Bank of Sam Chin, or whatever your LLC is, preferably in an LLC or entity, not your, your own personal name. So we'll cover a lot today. Like I said, feel free to ask questions. I prefer questions. It helps me steer this along the way. If I'm not getting any comments or questions, we'll may run through this in just a few hours for it, which is okay. I do encourage you. There's, there's quite a few places for you to get some more information. We'll cover that shortly for you. All righty. So let's, what do you say we get rock and rolling here and uh, get this cake party started? All right. 
So yes, we're the number one investor recommended training. We close notes. We're excited about that. That's our main website. We close notes.com. You can find our training podcast, all sorts of amazing things on there. Connect with me. And when it comes to, uh, to note weekend, like I said, ask questions, but let's keep them on point. Okay. I gave you the opportunity to ask any questions a few minutes ago. If you have a different question than what I'm covering, hold it till the end or send me a message. Okay. Uh, all sessions recorded. We will start and stop. One of the great things that I do, I think that everybody likes is I'm uh, very passionate about getting the replays out. So if you've got a bugger out, cause you're going to go watch the green Bay Packers or something like that, or go get, uh, to a party or something like that. I don't think they play till tomorrow or it's tonight's game. I don't know. Um, go Texans since the Cowboys got stomped on. <laughs> you can go back. I will send you the replay. If you're registered here in Zoom or you're registered uh, through the website so that you got to, hey, you're registered, we'll send you the replays and it will be split up in over like 13, 14, 15 short videos so that you can actually plug and play. You ain't got to rewatch the full four or five hours from start to finish. You can go and pick up where you left off. Okay. And we'll have those replays out to you probably no later than uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, we may be able to get the replays out sooner. Just depends on you know how, how late we go and how busy we are this, this afternoon. But we will usually try to do the, a uh, replay live on the day after on Sunday. So it may restream again for you guys on live before you get the replays. Please respect your fellow investors. If you're not happy with folks that are commenting or asking questions, just respect them. Don't be ugly. Treat people the golden rule. You don't have to always, you know, like them, but you will respect them, okay? Because everybody starts off in one place. I have one of my biggest pet peeves, and we see this happening, is this aggravates literally the hell out of me. I coach a lot of students who come over from different facets, and they're learning the note business, right? And I always, am, I always find it sad when you've got experienced people out there talking trash about new people. Like new, new people will make an offer and they miss something like, oh, I missed that. And the other person will like just bury them and pound them down. All oh, you're stupid. You shouldn't have known them. Like, come on, you got to cut these people, uh, new people some slack. They're learning. Everybody starts off learning. Nobody le comes out of the womb an expert note investor, right? And there are people out there that like to be just a-holes and that's fine. Let them be a-holes. There's plenty of, plenty of deal flow out there for you guys to make there, but respect it. And like I said, we encourage you to network with others and with us. We do have a Facebook group. It's about a thousand members, Note Nation. It's just there for you guys to network. We'll post some things there. It's, you know, Facebook groups, some are active, some aren't. Sometimes it's more active than others, but feel free to share there and connect with people out there. And then always feel free to jump online and connect with us through socials, through LinkedIn, especially, or like our YouTube channel, stuff like that, okay? And then we'll, if we've uh, got people hanging around at the end, we'll even do some live end of the day networking. If you're on, here on Zoom, we'll bring you on live. We want to talk about what your focus is and what you're looking for right in a way for you to kind of stand up in front of the class and go from there, okay? Other resources, free resources. Like I said, there's the, the Facebook group, great place for you to network with others. We have our uh, Note Night in America webinars. We have a variety of different educational webinars on Monday nights. We've hosted this for over 13 years now. It's the 13th year now coming back. This coming Monday night, we've got a really great special guest in Dr. Amanda Barrientes, who's a uh, mindset and an entrepreneurial coach who's phenomenal. I love her podcast. She is the host of the Inspired Entrepreneur Podcast and I had a chance to meet her, oh, what was it, about six months ago. And her stuff is just freaking awesome, okay? Uh, our YouTube channel, the number one note channel out there for you. And then, of course, please save this. This is my booking calendar. Talkwithscottcarson.com. Write it down. Book a phone call. Actually, while you're watching this right now, why don't you go online there? I'd love to hear from you. This is not a book a call for a sales pitch. That's not how I work, okay? This will not be giving you five minutes of nuggets and a 55-minute pitch fest down your throat. I don't work that way. I know others do that. I honestly want to hear from you. I want to talk with you because I could probably save you some grief. I know I was talking to two or three guys yesterday who had one plan because that's all they'd heard from one person. I'm like, well, here's how this actually works. You might want to tweak your business model or make it a little simpler for you. All right. And it's good. It's good to get a broad knowledge of notes, but you're going to end up finding that you're going to probably stick to one or two uh, strategies depending on what your strengths, weaknesses, times, monetary thing, aspect of that. And that's totally fine. There's no right or wrong as long as you're, uh, doing deals. That's what we like to see. Okay. Now the next steps here, 
After this one day class, we do have an upcoming three day workshop uh, slated for March, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd here in Austin, Texas. Um, you can get signed up for that by notebuyingfordummies.com. I would hang around because we do have a discount for our note weekend students. Uh, our monthly membership is $97 a month as well. This is ongoing monthly coaching call or weekly coaching calls and a variety of other things. Of course, we do have a mid-year convention we'll have again this year. Uh, note camp, we didn't do one last year because we did some other stuff, but we will have it come back again this year in 2024. And of course, we have a one-on-one -on -one coaching program that we'll talk about at the end, but we're not going to get into that right now. Let's get into talking about the different types of notes, shall we? All right, let's do that. All right, everybody, there is a variety of different debt instruments or notes out there that you're going to take a look at. Now, we're just going to focus on buying uh, notes that are backed by real estate, mortgages, first lien, second liens, residential, commercial, owner finance stuff. There's a variety of different things out there. Now, it really kind of falls down that debt falls into two categories right off the bat, institutional and non-institutional debt. Now, what does this mean? Institutional means it's been originated by a bank, a hedge fund, a, a mortgage company. A non-institutional debt would be some of its owner financed, okay? The reason I like buying institutional debt 99% of the time is it's cleaner, all right? Uh, for a bank or a mortgage company to finance a note or to originate a note, they're, guess what they're going to do before they ever sign the docs? They're going to make dang sure you usually... 99.9% .9 of the time that title is clear. It's going to have same documents. They've got their underwriting process, their loan application process. Everything looks pretty, you know, plug and play, very simple, very easy to understand. The collateral files, all that stuff is going to look very simple. Non-institutional debt owner finance. I've seen weird stuff that was written, you know, on a napkin. You know, you see home created mortgages. It's not quite the, you know, documents can vary. People may not collect, um, may not service the note properly in collections. It's just a whole variety of stuff. So I don't necessarily want to deal with non-institutional debt. I will look at it. I will buy owner finance notes from time to time, but I usually stick to the institutional side. Now, on the institutional side, you're going to be focusing on a variety of things. First liens, and there's residential first liens that are performing. These are notes where the borrowers have paid on time since origination. You have non-performing first liens. These are people who have fallen behind. Uh, and I consider it a non-performing note, somebody who's greater than 90 days behind. 90 days is pretty easy to catch up. We all had those hiccups, out of work, things like that. But non-performing, I consider something that's greater than 90 days behind. Um, you also have kind of what falls in between that too is re-performing notes. Notes that were once non-performing that an investor bought, was able to work the borrower out, get them back on track. And now it's re-performing and been performing for at least 6 to 12 months on time, okay? Now you also have a lot of residential junior liens, second liens, also performing and non-performing. I will not spend time on second liens, all right? I focus on the first liens. First liens are easier to raise capital for. You also get, I'd rather get bigger checks versus um, small checks. There's nothing wrong with it. If you've got a small amount, hey, great there. But here's the thing, second liens have become more expensive and they're no longer cheaper like they used to be. They're no longer buying them for pennies on the dollar because values have gone up. And second liens are over encumbered now in a lot of cases. They're just, uh, and there's also a lot less inventory. Okay. A lot of the, the people that were investing in second liens back in the day have gotten out of second liens because they couldn't survive because there was no inventory. They've gone into buying for traditional real estate investing. Nothing wrong with that, but we continue to stake in the non performing space because we still see non performing notes from a variety of places. Okay. Um, there was really maybe three to four major sellers of seconds back a few years ago. And when the inventory is dried up, two or three of them have gone the way and gone somewhere else, okay? Of course, there's commercial notes. Some of everybody's excited about commercial performing notes or commercial non-performing. Uh, the thing about commercial notes is you need to understand how to underwrite the cash flow of that asset. And if it's not performing, you're going to have a tougher time finding the information on the cash flow because you... Uh, a lot of times, sellers of the commercial stuff, they're not getting the financials of the bar because the bar is not performing. They're not providing. Now, in some cases, they are. Yes, they are. Banks were often very good about working out servicing and, and making sure that cap rates and NOIs and all that stuff work together. 
but you need to understand how to uh, evaluate a commercial asset, which is different than a residential asset. Residential be pretty easy. Rent rates, mortgage payment. There you go, right? Commercial, you got to figure out a, a, a variety of stuff. So, and evaluating apartments different from self storage. It's different from mixed use. It's different from an industrial. It's different from uh, uh, an RV park. You know, there's a lot of things out there. That's not saying you can't find stuff. We see distressed assets in that neck of the woods. I mean, you've seen all these apartment complexes that are in distress and starting to get foreclosed on. Uh, there's opportunity if you know that niche. Okay, so if you're looking for that stuff, it's a great place to be at right now. I started buying commercial paper right off the bat. Was the first stuff I bought. Okay. And uh, bought plenty of that stuff over the years. So I still look at that stuff. I still get stuff sent to me all the time that we take a look at. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense because the thing about commercial is the cash flow. If you can hold it, and, I mean, some of my best investors, people that taught me a lot, they bought a lot of commercial stuff back in the 80s and held on to it and held on to it. I'm a big believer that your residential stuff pays your bills. Okay. That's your meat and potatoes, pays your bills, and the commercial stuff you retire with. Okay. And going from there. Now, owner finance notes are very common. Same thing, performing and non-performing. I consider that non-institutional debt. Um, I've got to make sure that note is Dodd-Frank compliant. I got to make sure the borrower is up to date, make sure all the loan docs make sense. It's I, I actually, one of the biggest things I find that happen is people that get in, love the idea of owner finance and the owner finance a property, the idea to sell the note. I'm like, if you're just going to sell the note, forget that. Just sell the property. You're going to make more selling the property straight up than if you own or finance the property and carry. Now, of course, I understand tax consequences. It's good to hold on to if you're going to rehab a property, turn a rental, you want to hold on to it for at least a year. So you're, getting a, you're not getting a, um, a, a short-term capital gains tax, which we know that's another, you know, the difference we did, it's like a 20% tax right off the bat between the two, okay? Between that and long-term capital gains. But if you're wanting to sell the property, either, like I said, don't own or finance it. Expect to sell the note immediately. Just hold on to it for at least a year because you're going to better price than that later on. Contract for deeds are very common. We saw more of that back uh, in the mid uh, 2010s, early 2000s, because there was a lot of low value assets that were foreclosed on. Banks took back, they sold these portfolios of these vacant assets off to funds like Harbor Portfolio and a few others, who in turn turned around and owner financed those properties to borrowers without credit checks. Uh, if they could bring a thousand dollars down and pay a monthly payment at not, uh, you know thirty year mortgage on that property at nine point nine percent, you could you qualify for that. And we have bought a lot of contract for deeds. That's a non institutional debt that we do buy a lot of. Still look at stuff like that because it's pretty good cash flow. And there's often some equity in the deal that the borrower doesn't pay. We can evict. And yes, in, in a lot of states, a contract for deed you don't have to foreclose. You end up evicting. Now there's a few states that treat it separately. We're not going to go into the state by state basis of how each one is taught. You'll need to figure that out. And it's pretty easy to do, not difficult to do when you decide on your top states to be buying it. Okay, Lease options, you'll see some, some portfolios of that stuff. We don't buy lease options. We want to control the asset. Okay. Now, where should you focus? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the number one question I ask people all the time is, what are your goals? Okay. What's your long-term goal? And you should be thinking that. If you can't answer that question, you, you need to figure it out before you start sign up for workshops and start buying anything, okay? And most of the time, 90% of the time, it comes down to cash flow versus owning property. Yes, oh, I buy rental property. Well, do you buy rental property just to own property or do you buy it for the cash flow? Well, I buy it for the cash flow. Well, that's what it comes down to. You know, I, I crack up, we watch some shows and there's people out in California, oh yeah, I'm a millionaire on paper, real estate. Well, that's just because, I mean, what do you owe on that property? You see a ton of appreciation, it's great, but you, you can't, cash checks or pay bills with just appreciation. You just can't walk into uh, HEB or McDonald's and say, hey, I'm going to pay for this with appreciation, okay? You need cash flow. Okay? And that's what banks are in the business of. They're in the business of creating cash flow, right? Create a mortgage, boom, cash flow coming in. They're holding up and then they leverage that all out in a lot of ways, okay? Or they take your money in at one cent on the dollar or 1.1% 1 .1 and they loan that money out to create cash flow, okay? So we're all really looking for cash flow. Yes, it's great to buy property, like if you're in one state, like if I lived in Ohio or Michigan or Indiana, even Florida, I would probably just, you could just get away with just buying in those states because there's plenty of inventory out there. But I live in Austin, Texas. It's a beautiful city, a, a great city, but way overpriced, the 17th most unaffordable city in America based on 
some rankings that came out. If I just relied on Austin, I'd have gone broke a long time ago. All right. And we don't see that much stuff here because of the fast foreclosure process. So I buy, I, you know, I started off buying in three to five states that has blossomed out to, I think, over 20, 29, 30 states we buy in. I have to take a look at. We buy a lot of stuff across the country. There's good states, there's bad states. Um, and your idea here is, depending on where you live and what you're focused on and what your comfort level is, you're probably going to start off with three to five states and go from there. Okay. Now, of course, re return on investment is very important just because you, you don't buy a note just to buy a note. You got to understand your return on investment, but also your return on time. How much time do you have to commit? Now, most of our students are not full-time real estate investors, uh, probably a good 60, 70% still work. They still have a job. They still have a W-2. They do this as a hobby on the part-time side. That's great. But we do also have a chunk that have taken the leap and built a roadmap to success, a roadmap to leaving their job, quitting their job to be a full-time note investor. That doesn't mean they were working 40 hours and 40 hours themselves. They were started off 10, 20 hours, and they built cash flow. And they also focused on assets that had a good return on investment for them. There's some assets you'll hear me talk about. It's not worth just because it looks good. It doesn't make any sense because the return on investment plus also return on time doesn't make sense for you. Of course, inventory is very important. Where do you find it? What type of assets are you looking for in the asset class, but also what states are you looking for? If you're trying to buy distressed notes in California, it, that's not a smart play. For what you can buy one note in California, you can buy a whole block in like St. Louis, Kansas City, or other places. Okay. You've also got weird foreclosure laws in some states. So it doesn't make sense in a lot of uh, times to buy. Like I wouldn't buy anything in Washington State or Portland State or even like, California right now. It just doesn't make sense when you can get better deals and less red tape to go through if you've got to take the asset back and go from there. Also, there's other states I would avoid, like um, Crook County in Illinois. I wouldn't buy there. There's also some other licensing issues in other places there. And of course, pricing is important. Um, you know, what you can buy in Florida, you can buy a lot more in Ohio. Uh, pricing on an asset in Miami of Ohio is going to be a lot cheaper than a pricing on an asset in Miami, Florida. And like I said, it all comes down to really how much time do you have to put to anything, all right? If you work 80 hours a week, then you maybe only have 5 to 10 hours a week. If you're only working 40 hours, you may have 30, 20 hours to put into it. I don't know. You can only answer that and be honest with yourself. Here's the thing. I'm not going to tell you you got to put in five hours a day and clock in, leave your job, run home, say, hey, honey, I got to go work my other job at five to ten. No, no, you can do a lot of these things part time or some systems that we're going to talk about to leverage your what time you have to make it uh, to maximize. And there's ebbs and flows in this business. Sometimes you'll be looking at more assets. Other times you'll be doing more marketing for capital or doing more due diligence or servicing. OK. One of the most important videos I think you can watch, though, would be this. Uh, it's about a 30 minute video, how to make 100K in 12 month video. The link for it is bit.ly slash 100K in 22. In 22, we've done another one 100K in 23, 100K in 24. But that one is check it out, watch it, kind of outline the game plan for success, what most of our successful students are doing by buying one to two notes a month, building cash flow, positive cash flow part-time basis. Some are going faster than the number. Some are buying two, three, four, five notes a month. Others are starting off with one. But this is a solid game plan to help you get to that six-figure income for you and beyond. Okay. And we're very, very proud of the number of successful coaching students who've gone out there and applied this to their business and really found success and long-term wealth. Okay. And of course, what states you invest in are going to vary too. Uh, most, uh, Actually, all states will be divided into either a judicial foreclosure or a non-judicial foreclosure. Now, a judicial foreclosure is a longer process because you've got to go through the actual court system, okay? Um, usually, the fastest we've ever gotten through a judicial foreclosure was like six months. Now, that would be start to finish in some thing where the borrower didn't fight us, but we had still had to foreclose, okay? Now, the borrower is not willing to fight you and want to sign the property over to you, and there's no other liens on the property that you can't wipe out, then you could do it in a month. But in a lot of cases, judicial foreclosures are going to be at least probably around nine months to a year in a lot of cases. Minimum cost is, is going to be at least $3,500 or more. We really see closer to five. Um, most of the judicial foreclosures are east of the Mississippi. It doesn't mean like California has a judicial and a non-judicial process, and other states do too. Okay. Um, but what's great is you're buying in a longer 
a judicial foreclosure time frame state, you're going to usually get a cheaper price point. Now, I don't buy in New York, New Jersey. Those are the two longest. Puerto Rico, which is a judicial foreclosure, can take over two years to foreclose. So I don't buy. And yes, you can buy notes in Puerto Rico. Okay. You can buy in the Virgin Islands as well, too. Those, but they're longer foreclosure time frames in a lot of cases. I usually tell folks, you know, unless you're in a state that you have carnal knowledge and you only want to leave that one state, it's usually going to be good for you to have like two states that are non-judicial and two states that are uh, judicial. So you get to have, don't be afraid to foreclose if the numbers are going to make sense. If you're buying at the right price, realize it makes sense. Now, one of the, the difficult things and one of the biggest mistakes I made early on in my note investing career is I was going to foreclose on everything. Any note I bought, I was throwing it in the foreclosure pile. I was paying out money to attorneys and servicing and not getting any money in. And I could have modified it or reinstated a lot of those or worked with the borrowers. And I should have done that earlier on more so, especially the first two years. It took me a while to understand the power of cash flow on that aspect of things. And it would, it's actually a best bang for the buck. Now, John, judicial foreclosures are non-judicial. You don't have to go in front of the judge. Once you're late, or once the bar is 90 days or 120 days late, depending on the state, you basically file a public uh, public notice, and guess what? You're foreclosing. And uh, short time frames are like, like anywhere from 21 to 120 days. 21 days being Texas, because we do everything fast here, for fast foreclosures, fast highways, and fast executions, right? Um, 120 days, I think, is, is Tennessee, North Carolina. It's less expensive you know, to do a, a non-judicial foreclosure because you're basically just filing. You don't have to go hire an attorney go through all the process of going through court. I mean, you still need to hire an attorney to foreclose. You need to do that in every state, but it's less expensive. Some is as little as a thousand bucks here in Texas and up from there. Most of the states west of the Mississippi um, do that. Uh, and you're usually going to pay a little higher price point for those assets. Like if you're trying to buy in Texas or Georgia, which are the two fastest, you're going to pay a premium because it's Texas because the banks and the sellers understand you can foreclose faster in Texas. So they're going to charge a little higher premium because otherwise Instead of them selling the note to you, it and they, they're already started the foreclosure process, they can just foreclose and take the asset back anyway. So keep that in mind. Doesn't mean you won't find deals in those states. We do all the time still. You just got to know how the market. We'll talk more about that later on. Licensing requires is one of the big questions. Do I need a license to do this? And the answer to that is uh, no and yes. Okay. No, you don't need it in most of the states. Now, what you do need is most states require there to be a licensed debt collector collecting the debt or servicing the loan. So if you have a servicing company who's licensed in the state that your note is at, that covers you about 90% of the time. There are a few other states that want you to have a separate debt collector's license, or they want you, a few other states want you to be a licensed mortgage broker um, to do that. And those are the states we tend to avoid. I mean, you can still get a mortgage broker or a partner of the mortgage broker in those states. Like Georgia wants you to be a licensed mortgage broker unless you're using your IRA to buy the note. And that's an exception there for you. Okay. But most of the time we're just buying in the states that our servicers are licensed in. You know, like I said, they don't need to be licensed in all 50 states. They're not servicing in all 50 states. Okay. Um, yeah. Ohio's got, you got to be a licensed, you got to get a separate license if you're collecting uh, second liens there. Illinois, once you pay like 750, it's good for two years to be a debt collector's. Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, man, they want you to be basically a separate license. Besides your servicer, Georgia, like I said, requires a mortgage broker license unless you're using your self-directed IRA, okay? And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy. Just check, you know, does Georgia, what, what are the licensing requirements for that? Or email me, and I'm glad to talk about it individually there for you. But here's the thing. Most of your... If you're going to hire a loan service that's licensed in the state, ask them, do you know what other licenses do I that I need to have in the state that I'm buying? And they'll tell you. Really easy to tell you, okay? Now, what is available for you to buy in today's market? Well, we talked about this briefly. There's re-performing notes. Those are notes that were once non-performing. Somebody bought them at a discount from the existing lender. They worked with the bar. They got them back on track, and the bar has been paying on time for six to 12 months. Those can be great deals that can yield you a double-digit return. Yes, you can make double-digit returns with some uh, re-performing notes. Non-performing notes, bigger discounts means bigger yields, but you've just got to roll up your sleeves or have your team roll up your sleeves like your servicing company attorneys, and it's going to take some borrower outreach to either get the bar back on track or start the foreclosure process. Contract for deeds, we talked about those, performing and non-performing. 
There's a lot of non non performing commercial notes out there too. Just be obviously they take a little bit more time, more due diligence. They're a longer process. You know, if you're buying an individual residential note in a single family home, you should be able to buy and close in a week or two. If you're buying a commercial note, that could be 90 days. Um, you're going to see notes on platforms. I say old notes because there are some trading platforms out there that they've got older notes that have been around for a while. I don't buy off of platforms. I use the platforms as ways to find other buyers or other sellers of notes. Okay. And then you'll also see newly originating owner finance notes. <clears throat> I don't buy that, but you'll see that. Um, you, and here's the thing. You can buy some of these owner finance notes, but it's a lot more work on the front end of mailing out to people who have owner financed an asset and then trying to get them to, you know, talk with you, take a discount, make a point. I would rather deal with banks and hedge funds or mortgage companies that have a list and they're motivated to move them already in a lot of ways versus an owner finance seller. Okay. Plus it's more deals on a regular basis coming in from banks and hedge funds than it is from the one guy in Ohio or Oklahoma who financed a property. Okay. Now, like I said before, when we got started a little bit, you got to have a banker's mindset versus a fix and flip mindset, okay? You're buying the note, not the property, okay? You're buying the collateral file. This is really what you're buying with your money. And this collateral file gives you all the rights to foreclose and own that asset or take the asset back if what? If the borrower doesn't, doesn't pay, okay? They don't follow the terms of the loan. They don't keep insurance on the property. They don't pay the taxes. You have the right to foreclose, okay? Here's another thing. We as real estate investors, when we see a distressed property, we get excited about equity, right? Oh, the guy only owes 100. He's not paying. It's worth 150. I can take that asset and get a $150,000 asset. As a banker, you are not entitled to that equity. Quit. So quit chasing equity in the note business. If he owes 100 and the house is worth 150, you're only entitled to foreclose for up to 100. Now, if it doesn't sell the auction and you take it, it and you can take it back, now you own the asset, right? It sells above what you're owed at auction. It sells for 120 and you're only owned 100. Guess what? You get 100. That other 20 goes to any other second lien holder or it goes back to the actual borrower. And a lot of people screw this up. They come in from the fix and flip side, the landlord side, and they overbid on non performing notes. You got to understand the difference in the opportunity. You got to look at it differently. It's taking one hat off, putting a different hand on. And what you want to do is, is streamline your, your product's focus, as I say. You know, don't be chasing and buying everything. I talked about this on a podcast the other day that a lot of people like to chase all these different notes. Oh, I, I buy everything. Well, if you're a buyer of everything, you're not really a, a buyer of anything, okay? When you say that, oh, I buy anything, first, seconds, you know, I, eh, but do you, or are you more of a broker, okay? I'm a big proponent of streamlining your product focus. And by products, I mean your cookie cutter, single family homes, three bedroom, two bath, three ones, Built after 1970 or, 19, or 2000, depending on where you live, and focusing on where you need to get the bar back on track, deed to foreclose. Those are your three major strategies. There are more strategies after you take the asset back if you want to sell it um, or turn it into rental or owner finance. You can do that things. I don't like doing those things. I want to streamline my process, either get them reperforming or take the assets back. And then sell them off and cash in, cash out, or like that. No, I will focus at some rental properties, some areas. I don't want to do a lot of fix and flips unless they're in a couple states. But you try to streamline it. You're not going to try to do 30 rentals in 30 different states. That would be mind boggling. Okay. Avoid the shiny object squirrel syndrome. I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, look at this asset. It looks so pretty. Or it's on the beach in San Diego. I'm going to get it at 50 cents of the dollar. Like, no, you're not. They're not going to get it at 50 cents of the dollar. The bank knows what they have. You can get probably a little bit of discount, but it's not going to be. Drop dead most of the time. I had one guy that wanted to argue with me about that. I'm like, well, go try to offer $5,000 for that half a million dollar asset and see what happens. You're just wasting your time. It's better to come in with a normal bid somewhere at 300, 400,000 because that's what, really what the bank's looking for. And you can still make money at that. Okay. Like I said, your number one priority when you see me, and if you look back at some of our videos on YouTube of me breaking down assets, one of the first things I do after slicing and dicing, getting rid of the junk off it. So I start calculating cash flow, start calculating what's the return if we get the borrow back on track, what's the return if we get them to pay a little bit extra uh, or bring some money to the table. Those are the first things. And that's the really the first point to look at to make sure it's a good yield for us. OK. Taking back the property and doing fix and flips should be your secondary strategy. Yes. Do you take property back? Yeah, we take some. 
about 60, 70 percent of the time, we're able to get the bar back on track for cash flow. And you're going to have to foreclose. You have to be prepared to foreclose. But our goal is when we have to do that is, does it make sense to keep it? Or does it make more sense to cash it and cash that depending on how long the foreclosure process is? Okay. Any questions about that before we start diving into um, more of how to find these deals? All right. I know I, I talk fast. I cover, we got a lot of information to cover. Like I said, this is the high end stuff. If you want to really dive into the nuts and bolts and want to take a, a, a great class to do that, then I would sign up for our three day class coming up in March, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, no buying for dummies.com. Okay. Anybody got any questions there online? We are monitoring the chat room, both places. All right, let's move on. All right, so like the number one question people love to ask me is, Scott, how do you find these? Who are the sellers of these notes? Do I go down, to, is there an MLS, like a multiple listing service that I can take a look at? Or can I go down my local bank and knock on the door and say, hey, I want to buy your notes? The answer to both of those is no, okay? But there's ways to find these. These are internal, the people that handle these note sales are internal departments of banks and lending institutions. We'll talk to you how to get home. It's actually easier than we think it would be, especially in today's world. It's much easier, okay? Now, the ways, the different places to find note sellers. We find notes from a variety of sources. Do not do like a lot of people and rely on one source. If you just rely on one source, when that source dries up, you're out of business, okay? And unfortunately, a lot of note investors got fat and happy off of one, two, or three funds that were sending out lists on a monthly basis, and that's great. But when they went out of business, guess what? Oh, there's no notes, can't find nothing. Scott Carson, these other people teaching notes, too many students, they're overbidden. You got to evolve and learn how to market in today's world. Banks, lending institutions, mortgage bankers, servicing companies, note conferences, conventions, LinkedIn, private sellers, using the county clerk to search for assignments of mortgages, foreclosure lists. There is a whole kick caboodle way to find notes, Okay. You just got to learn how to market. Nobody's If you fall over, nobody with your credit card them up in the air, nobody's going to come running up to you. You got to, I know, market. And some marketing scares some people. It is not difficult. Mostly, once you get in the right departments of banks, if you just follow up with them, guess what? You're going to get deals sent to you. You just got to follow up, and it's not a hard thing. Heck, you can literally go to the county clerk right now and see all these notes that have been sold and reach out to the sellers. You can literally go to your fork if you're, in the foreclosure market, how many of you guys who are on here right now have gotten a foreclosure list or track your for, this, your county or multiple counties foreclosure sales? A few of you are, right? Well, guess what? When you buy that foreclosure list or you download that foreclosure list or you go to the county website and they provide a list, those are all distressed notes. You can reach out to the bank and see about buying that note, which is not going to be a very fruitful thing, but you, you can still get deals that way. But it's fruitful because I don't really target the list for the actual assets that month. I target the list to get in the back door to get on the bigger list. Like if there's IBC Bank here in Texas and they've got a, um, a, a, a property in San Antonio, a note they're foreclosing on. I'll reach out to them. Yeah, would I try to buy that note? Yes, I would try to buy that note. But my whole goal is not to just to get that one note in San Antonio. My whole note. The goal is to get the list of everything they have in Texas or everything they have on their portfolio they can get rid of. So that's how we leverage foreclosure list is a hot lead into the right bank or the attorney to get on their whole list of notes across the state, across the country. Okay, You can go and find different servicing conferences, note conferences. You'll find sellers there. Um, we go through a lot of this in day one of our workshop, literally whole day one of no buying for dummies is all about finding assets and show you how to find it. It's a whole lot easier than most people bring it out to. But when you're reaching out to banks, you're not going to walk down the bank to your local Wells Fargo, Chase, a Bank of America and walk and say, hey, I want to buy notes. They're going to laugh at you. Those people in the banks don't even know anything about note sales. Okay. When I was a banker for Chase, I didn't know anything about notes. I remember one guy walking in and say, hey, we want to buy your notes. I'm like, what are you talking about? The bank doesn't sell their notes. Chase does, but they sell them in like $50 million tranches. So if you're interested, you can literally go over to LinkedIn and start searching. I encourage you to do this. It'll actually blow you away by how many people have these titles at different banks. So like um, large institutions, they'll have a special assets department or they'll have a special assets manager. 
Okay. Those are things to search for. You'll find all these people. What do you say to them? Hey, are you the right person in charge of your note sales? I would love to talk with you or see what you have in your books that you're looking to get rid of this quarter. Copy, paste, copy, paste. Okay. Uh, another name a lot of them go for is secondary marketing department or the secondary marketing manager. Same thing. You'll see these on banks, REITs. I'm not going to target credit unions. Somebody asked me about that the other day. Credit unions are too small. Yes, some will have mortgages, but most of them don't. Okay. Um, you also will see REITs, real estate investment trust, insurance companies will have something called a whole loan sales department. REITs and insurance companies like to, like to buy mortgage debt. It's a great cash flow. It's a great product for them. It provides I mean, uh, constant cash flow in a lot of cases. So we've gotten tape sent to us from whole loan sales departments quite a bit. Okay, that's when you're, you got to kind of expect to be looking at maybe buying a portfolio of them. Okay, and then smaller banks, like your one-off banks, your smaller institutions, will have a chief credit risk officer. It might actually be the loan officer at a small bank who, who knows what's going on. These are going to be a little bit harder uh, to buy at a discount because the banks often can't take that big a discount um, because they just don't have the the reserves, the deposits, stuff like that. So this is why I usually will target banks that have at least five branches or greater. Okay. Now, there are some websites out there that you can help you find notes, like LaneGuide.com. Been around for forty plus years. Um, we've used Lane Guide. It's like I think it's like a it's under two hundred bucks a year to log into it, and it will track who bought who, bank what what bank bought what bank. You also can search for asset managers on there, and it'll give you a, a, a list that's uh, about sixty percent accurate with names, phone numbers, and, and emails for you at different banks. Bauer Financial tracks the quarterly filings that uh, banks. I have to file to have FDIC insurance. And it literally will tell you, you can actually buy a downloaded list. They send you a spreadsheet of where a bank ranks, three stars, four stars, five stars, um, what they have under management, you know, what's in default, if they what's over 90 days in default, what's coming down the pipeline. It's really a nice list. FDIC.gov, you can literally go direct to the source and look at any bank's quarterly filings to see what they have. Uh, Texas Savings and Mortgage Lending is something we've used quite a bit in the past. It used to be really easy for you to go there and download a list of mortgage bankers that were licensed to do business in Texas. You know, mortgage companies from all across the country. You can still get this list. Um, it, it, the mortgage banker list is about 5,000 names. It could give you about 290 servicing companies, servicing loans in Texas, which is, those are two great sources to find notes. You just need to request it going to their website, reaching out to somebody there now, we request it versus an easy download, okay? And then every other state out there has a different licensing department. Like with California, it's the Board of Real Estate. Florida, I think it's the insurance thing. Each state's a little bit different in who actually handles their uh, mortgage licensing. And that's what you want to do. Talk with target folks that are mortgage bankers or servicing companies licensed to do business in that state. They're going to have loans and stuff that they have on their portfolio or servicing on behalf of others they can take down. Scotchman Guide's been around for a while, too. It's like a, a, a magazine for mortgage brokers showing residential commercial lending programs out there. We use Scotchman Guide to find distressed commercial notes more than anything else, okay? commercial properties that are in distress by reaching out to the actual lenders or the portfolio lenders who originate stuff on apartments or self-storage or RV parks that may have, taken some, may have some stuff that's not performing, okay? Um, there are some platforms you can take a look at. You can look at paperstack.com. You can look at Watermark. Well, Watermark Exchange really hasn't been around for a while. They've got some stuff on there, but it's not really up to date. SN Servicing sends out stuff on a regular basis once you register. Uh, Deb Experts, another platform. You can look at some stuff on there. Uh, Fixnotes.com. you got some ugly stuff on there. Um, probably the better looking stuff is going to be on 10x and auction.com. 10x is the Commercial arm of auction.com, and you'll see commercial assets on there. Mission Capital Advisors, Note Trader Exchange, DebtX, uh, Exchange.loans is another platform you can take a look at to find some stuff. I, I don't like platforms like Jump so much for the most part because, like, Paperstack is, I think they had like 121 like yesterday. Um, a lot of it's uh, owner finance stuff that they don't want to take that big a discount, or it's been on there for a while. I, I, I prefer to do my due diligence and find and, and go make direct connections of banks and asset managers and then market on a monthly basis where I can drip market them. And drip marketing means sending an email out, making a phone call, connecting with them on a monthly basis to see what they have. Because you never know when somebody will have something, but we've built a, an asset manager list of over 5,000 names over the last 20 years that that's works really well. And we are constantly going back and edit and tweak that list uh, as people leave, but it, that's part of drip marketing 
is just touching base. And I'd rather send one email out to 5,000 banks and asset managers on a monthly basis to get stuff sent to me versus having to try to deal with 5,000 individual finance notes that people don't want to deal with. I've got a much higher hit rate and success rate deal flow wise. You know what I mean? Let's work smarter, not harder. Any questions about that before we move on to the next session? All right, moving on. All right, so we talked in the previous session about the different places to find stuff and how I'm a fan of using like LinkedIn to go over LinkedIn and search for like special ask manager, secondary marketing manager, and those job titles to find and go direct to the source. Why not go upstream and get better deals, cleaner paper, and more deals than trying to deal with one-offs, okay? Now, I, I, you can buy one-offs from banks. So I'm saying, is I'd rather get a list of 100 or 200 that I can cherry pick from every month, every quarter, versus trying to send out 100 different letters and postcards that only get like 1% to 4% response for like one deal, okay? So what do you say? What and what not to say when talking with asset managers? This is one of the most important slides you have to understand, okay? You're going to have a basic elevator pitch. When we go through this and provide some scripts in our three-day class, what do you have on your books that you're looking to move? That's basically the first line. Hi, my name is Scott Carson. I'm the owner of WeCloseNotes.com. I've been a, a debt buyer and real estate investor for 20-plus years. I'm buying notes for my own portfolio. What do you have on your books that you're looking to move? All right. Uh, I am, or we're looking to buy for our own portfolio. You always say this. Never say you're a broker. Okay. We're looking for something with some hair on it, non-performing stuff. You know, when we say some hair on it, it's kind of lingo that's been on their books for a while, not working and growing some hair, or growing some mold. Okay. Uh, we're looking to work it out with the homeowners or the borrowers. We always try to modify, try to keep them in their house. They like to hear that. They don't want to hear, oh, we're just going to foreclose on anything. But we try to keep them back on track. We're looking for single family homes, you know, 100 grand or greater in these markets or states. Now, I don't say, I say in most major markets, the more specific you get, like, oh, I'm only looking for stuff in Texas, eh, so is everybody and their dog, okay? Be specific. I buy across the country. It's a much more valuable comment than I want to buy in Austin, Texas. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Like I had one guy, um, great guy, nice guy. He just buys in South Carolina. I only buy in South Carolina. I actually just prefer Charleston. I'm like, that's great, but that's not how this works. If you just want to focus on one city where you're already in, this is not the strategy for you. Yes, can you maybe get some notes occasionally? Yeah, you can. But it makes more sense for the work you're going to do. You're going to get stuff in all across the country. It makes more sense for you to understand that there are opportunities outside of just your backyard. Okay, Your, your market is not your zip code or your city. Your market is multiple states. It's literally the, almost the entire United States in some sort of fashion. Okay? Keep that in mind. Uh, do not say this. These are some of the most important things not to say. I have $20 million a month to buy. Nobody has that. If you had that to buy, you're not the guy that would be calling or the gal that would be calling. Okay? Don't be that, don't be that douchebag joker broker that says that. If they can smell it a mile away, they're not going to believe. Okay? I'm looking for notes and REOs. I'm looking for everything. No, you're not. REOs, a real estate loan, that's a foreclosure. That's great. But you, if you call the bank, you're probably in a, in a department of call is the main corporate office, the main switchboard operator. If you say notes and REOs, they're going to forward you to the REO department, which is basically it's a voicemail box and say call the listing agent. Okay. I'm looking for your notes, your special assets, the secondary marketing department. I'm buying non performing notes or distressed notes. Okay. Do not say I'm looking to broker or wholesale. They don't need brokers. They don't need wholesalers. You're buying for your own portfolio. Even if it's only for 10 minutes, okay? You're still buying for your own portfolio. Don't say I represent a buyer. Eh, we don't need, oh, I'm a buyer's rep, buyer's mandate. Oh, it's, I get people that call me like that and I can smell right straight through the phone call. I'm like, you're a choker broker. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Nobody uses that anymore. And like I said, I'm looking for anything. No, you're not. Be specific. When I buy notes at 100, from 100 grand to a million, I'm buying in most of the major markets. Uh, I don't buy in New York or New Jersey because you'll get people like, oh, you buy everywhere? No, I don't buy in New York or New Jersey. Oh, crap. But I'm looking for single family homes. I'll look at condos too. Condos, duplexes. I'll look at that stuff. Um, I, um, I'll look at small balance commercial really under $5 million for the most part. Okay. 
like I said, don't be specific. The more specific you are, the harder it's going to be. What you want to do is have that estimation. Make it simple for them just to hit the download button and export it and to send it to you. The whole list. Okay. And then leverage social media, leverage LinkedIn, and leverage Facebook to help you with your due diligence assets. But also, if you then want to wholesale some notes, wholesale them to other note investors across the country. Okay. Now, uh, if you can find an email address, which you can on some of those websites like LingGuide, LinkedIn, some other places there for you. Uh, and there are good times to email and bad times to email bankers. And a great thing by using like Keep, uh, K-E-A-P.com, which is my CRM that we use for email blasts and stuff like that and tracking, uh, you can pre-schedule your emails. You don't have to run home at five o'clock to send an email. You wouldn't want to send an email at five o'clock anyway. The best time, and this is not just from me, this is literally like the American Marketing Association tracking the best times and best open rates for emails. So the best time to send an email is Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, all right? And actually, the number one day of that is Wednesday at roughly 10 a.m. Why? Well, Monday is the horrible time. They come back from the weekend. They're inundated. They're busy putting out fires that happen over the weekend. Friday is not a good day because why? It's the weekend, baby. We're going to take our two-hour lunch and cut out early, okay? So if you're going to email, send it, send it to Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. I don't send an email usually after 3 o'clock. Um, I, I get it. You're going to be sending people that are sometimes on the East Coast and the West Coast. The whole guy, the whole idea is if you send something, send a follow-up email, okay? You'll see probably a 10 to 20% open rate the first time you send out to asset managers. You send it a second time, and I mean send it a second time, 48 hours later, you'll get about fully a 5 to 8% open rate on the uh, second email. And a third email, two to three days later, you see a one to four percent open rate, but that's still thirty percent open rate, um, which is can be pretty good, right? I mean, ten percent on a thousand—that's a hundred people that open your email that may have something. That's better than sending out hundred letters, right? Much higher open rate. Like I said, if I send an email out Wednesday or Tuesday, I'll send another email out forty dollars later on Thursday to those that didn't open. I'll send my third email out Tuesday morning to those that didn't open the email on on Thursday. And I, if it's if I send one in the morning, I send one in the afternoon. The system works. You just have to do it and get in the habit of doing it and setting these things up to do it. Okay. Now, if you're going to make some phone calls, which people are scared of that thousand pound phone, right? Pound for dollar still works. It still works, ladies and gentlemen. Still definitely works. Okay. But the best time to call asset managers, Tuesday through Thursday, same thing. Don't call them on Monday. Don't call them on Friday. Uh, between 10 and noon and 2 and 5 p.m. their time, okay? And you're going to have some good success if you do this. And once again, leave voice messages. If you make 50 phone calls, you're probably going to talk to 14 people, probably get three to four people that send you an NDA or have a list, and then you're, you're going to close on a deal off of that. But always speak clearly, slowly. Hey, this is Scott Carson. Thanks. Uh, I'm just, I'm a, been an active note buyer for 20 years. I was told you're the right person. Uh, that handles your bank's non-performing note sales, distressed assets. I'd love to talk with you. Uh, we're buying for our own portfolio and would love to discuss what you have in your books that you're looking to move this quarter or next. Okay, repeat. My number is 512-585-3810. Once again, the number is 512-585-3810. And smile when you dial. Don't be like a box of rocks. Okay, I'm not full of rocks, Okay. People like energy. They like good energy. They don't want to be like screaming on the phone. Send me your stuff now. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, what do you have on your books? I'd love to talk with you. And the thing is, too, is besides calling, if you got an email, then guess what? Follow up with an email. And then follow up, guess what? With like a LinkedIn message or LinkedIn connection. Okay? Expect to follow up, follow up, follow up. And if you ever start thinking, well, I don't want to bother them. You're not bothering them. You're just got to realize they're busy. Right? I've had people, the, some of the best assets I've gotten have come from me making phone calls and following up for three, four weeks, 30, 40, 50 phone calls. So I got the right apartment because then I was the only guy or gal they were sending stuff out to or a small amount, right? And they saw that I wouldn't give up. So they finally added me the list, send an email, make phone calls, connect on LinkedIn with the asset managers and repeat the process. 80% of sales are made after the fifth contact. You have to realize this. I had a conversation the other night with a lady who's gotten a, had a list sent to her. I said, did you follow up with him to figure out pricing? Oh, I sent one email. Well, did you call him? No. When did you call him? Two weeks ago. Well, follow up. They forgot about you five minutes or 10 minutes afterwards. You got to realize these people are busy. 
You need to call and call and call. Don't take no for an answer, you know, and make keep you a, a spreadsheet or use some sort of CRM. A spreadsheet is the minimum of who you call, when you talk to them, and their number. It's your hot list to reach out to, okay? And we've got a uh, four-plus-hour four video online of me making phone calls to ask the manager. So you kind of see the conversations. You see what I'm saying. hear what I'm saying. And uh, I think it's valuable for you to, to watch that few hours and, and see what we do and how we do it. It's not difficult. Most people are like, oh, that's a whole lot less work and scarier than I thought. Most of these asset managers, just normal people like you, they've got their job. Okay? Call, have a conversation. You'll learn more from that than anything else. And when I first started dialing for dollars years ago, we didn't have LinkedIn. I didn't have email blasts. I just pulled a list and started Googling phone numbers and started getting transferred over. And the first list I got was coming, was on the 55th phone call on one day, 54th or 55th phone call. I could have given up. All right. Everything went wrong. I, I made, I botched a bunch of phone calls. I called late in the day. The last phone call I made on that Thursday afternoon, it led me to the right person. That was a $50,000 payday. So every nail I got was like a worth a thousand bucks. When I got into Capital One, it took me 70 phone calls over three weeks. So, and the first note I closed was a $35,000 profit. So every note was worth 500 bucks over the 70 phone calls. So keep that in mind. It's still going to be higher rewarding than bandit signs and postcards and yellow letters to get more deals sent to you on a regular basis. We're talking these can be million-dollar relationships to you if you will just follow up and play the, play the game, okay? Like I said, our note buying for dummies workshop is March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. We spend a full day Friday on finding deals, the second day on funding deals, how we raise capital, and the third day on the flipping the exit strategies and how to structure deals. And you can get signed up by going to notebuyingfordummies.com. Like I said, it's March 1st, 2nd, 3rd. And if you use the code WEEKEND, all caps, WEEKEND, you'll get it for half price. That's a live workshop here in Austin, Texas. All right. That doesn't include room and board. You got to get here and pay for the hotel, but the hotel's cheap here for it. It's a nice thing here. Um, and then guess what? You'll get the uh, 200 plus page manual. You'll also get replays to the December workshop. So you don't have to wait till March to learn. You can actually get the replays to the workshop we taught on Zoom in December. That's three days, uh, 24, 25 videos for you to watch that uh, electronic copy of the manual. And then we also have a four-week implementation coaching that we provided to those students as well. And we just finished up with week three where that week four is uh, this coming Thursday. And guess what? You'll get access to that to watch and learn and help you apply that stuff. So big proponent in helping you guys take your business to the next level. Like I said, it's normally $9.97 per person for the workshop. If you sign up for it, you'll get it at half price. And you can bring a spouse, or one spouse or one guest at that half price. Okay? I'm making it really stupid amazingly cheap for you guys because it is a class we'll be working through tapes we'll be working through marketing there's all sorts of great case studies we'll give you we'll show you how we raise millions of dollars in private capital and how we talk to investors lots of great stuff for you no buying for dummies.com and use a discount code weekend to get it at half price okay all right um and we also have a monthly membership some people would like to do that that's 97 dollars a month that gets you access to the class the virtual classes uh, there's a little bit, uh, there's a price for you to come to attend in Austin for that, but it's still cheaper if you're signed up for a monthly membership. I'll get a lot of great stuff. That's $97 a month and get signed up for a monthly membership at noteumbrella.com. That's noteumbrella.com for you. This is the biggest bang for the buck in the note industry because we really go through a lot of great stuff. You get access to the calling banks training, access to the wholesaling notes, wholesaling um different master classes we've taught, marketing. We've got one coming up this year on raising capital. It is a phenomenal aspect. And those are the two things that we're, we're talking about today for you, the three-day workshop or the monthly membership for $97 a month, okay? Any questions about either one of those? All right, good stuff. All right, everybody, our next session here is all about, it's session five, is about markets and pricing kind of expectations when it comes to buying notes. Now, market expectations, they will vary, kind of like we talked about a little bit beforehand, they'll vary based on a variety of issues, whether the popularity of the, the area, uh, the market, uh, the different market values, obviously, um, the foreclosure timeframes has something to do with it, where they're at in the, the foreclosure process. 
Um, population density is definitely, I think you should, when you're starting off, you want to probably stay in areas either that you A, know, like the back of your hand or populations of 50,000 or more in it. And like I said, location, you really want to avoid rural assets, small market assets. It just, it makes it harder to foreclose, harder to get it rehabbed. I grew up in South Texas, okay? Down by Corpus Christi. Um, grew up in a little small town called Ingleside. It's about 10,000 people live in Ingleside now, okay? Now, would I buy down there? I would buy down there or in Aransas Pass or Port Aransas because I know that area. I've got friends. I've got colleagues that can do everything I need to do. If I was living in Ohio or Wisconsin, would I buy down there? No. I mean, no, if you're going to end up having to foreclose and take the asset back. You, now, would it make sense for you to buy it and then maybe flip it to somebody? Yeah, you could do that. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily look to buy and hold on to that long term because you just don't know what's going on. You don't have the relationships and stuff like that. So that's the thing. And you're going to build relations over time. I built relationships all across the country because I traveled all across the country. I sold everything I owned back in 2010 and traveled the country for what I thought would be like half a year, turned it into three and a half years in nonstop travel. Okay. So it also depends on what kind of inventory is available. Like I, I mentioned this before, notes in Austin, Texas, you just don't see a lot of them. Okay. I've actually, I see more in Austin, Minnesota than I do see here in Austin, Texas. Okay. So keep that in mind. You know, I've got one guy that I know he just buys in Florida and that's fine. He buys in Florida, but he buys all over Florida, not just down in his, like in Miami. Okay. Uh, what's hot in the market? Most expensive note markets right now, obviously California's way overpriced. 90, 95 cents a dollar for non-performing. Arizona is still hot because uh, people in California being a bother. Texas is, is hot. I would say, Texas notes are more popular than Arizona, California, just because you have the faster foreclosure process. Nevada is also hot, specifically Reno, Las Vegas. Georgia is also very hot because of the 30 days to foreclose time frame there. Um, th that's where the West Coast assets, that's really the most expensive stuff. Doesn't mean it's hot as in good deals in a lot of cases, but that's where the most expensive stuff is at. Now, what's not hot, the le my least favorite markets, New York State can take you two to three years to foreclose. New Jersey can take you two years to foreclose unless it's a vacant asset. It's got a, a streamlined foreclosure process if the house is vacant. Kentucky requires you to have a half million dollar bond for an individual or a million dollar bond in an entity. Uh, it's not worth that. Uh, Chicago is rough if you, if you don't live there. Cook County is one of the most corrupt counties in the country. If you live in Chicago, okay, not so bad but it's still going to take you about a year for to foreclose. If you don't live in Chicago, I would just avoid it like the plague. Okay. That's my personal opinion. Been there, got the t-shirt, the scars and lost $250,000 or more in Chicago. Okay. Also assets under $30,000 with a fair market value of $30,000 or below. I would just avoid them. They're usually uh, ugly ass property. Now this is, you know, that's different. Now, if you're buying land lots, you know, or land and you're happy with that, that's totally fine. Different store. If it's an area you like or you like mobile homes, that's fine. Not a problem. I'm not talking about that. Okay. If you have experience, like I got my money, uh, Matrice. Um, big money Matrice. All right. He buys mobile home. He bought, he lives, uh, buys in Alabama. He lives in Georgia. He, he's around the neck of the woods. He's happy with that. I'm like, that's great. Turn him into rentals. Yeah, that's what he's doing. Uh, so good for him. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the idea here is you want to find your your buy box, know what your buy box is, what you're comfortable with, what you're happy with, what you're, I mean, he manages those himself because they're all close to where he's at and that's totally fine. I wouldn't want to buy 50, I wouldn't want to buy 50 uh, mobile homes across the country. Now I would buy them in one area, maybe not higher property manager in that one area, but if it was all across the country, now I wouldn't want to do that, okay? Uh, also high equity note deals with a ton of equity, you know, hundred grand or more, Oftentimes, the seller is going to want 80 to 90 cents of what's owed, and it just doesn't make sense in a lot of cases, okay? Uh, where's the most inventory now? Still Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, outside of Cook County, um, Missouri, Kansas as well. Uh, you see a lot in Florida, the Carolinas, South and North Carolina. South Carolina takes about a year to foreclose. It's a judicial state. North Carolina is a non-judicial, but it's kind of a weird auctioning bidding website. A bidding uh, process. Florida can take you a year roughly to foreclose. Missouri's 90 days. Uh, we already talked about Illinois can be over a year. Indiana's a <clears throat> judicial foreclosure, but it's like 14 days to evict, so it's not bad at all. 
Uh, about nine months to foreclose. Michigan's non-judicial, about 90 days. Ohio is judicial, takes about nine months. So uh, not bad. I mean, if you know, look at those things, small balance, commercial real estate. You know, you see a lot of this stuff, sub $5 million in fair market value. I think that's a, a, a definitely an opportunity all across the country in that. You see a lot of that sub $5 million. The big, big boys, the hedge funds, Wall Street doesn't want to waste their time with that. But it's a lot of stuff that local banks have financed over the last decade, 15 years plus, is that small balance commercial. So there's some opportunity for you. Pricing models, uh, non-performing. So there's this thing, if there's equity or non-equity, okay? And here's, I always laugh about this. I see this. People in the industry say, oh, don't use the stair-step method. It's a, it's a horrible strategy. Here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. If a seller is not going to give you a price of what they want, you got to run it. You have to protect yourself, okay? The stair-step method is one way to do that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, okay? Uh, Non-performing notes with equity, where they the, the asset's worth more than what's owed, you're going to have to expect to pay 80 to 95% of either UPB or the legal payoff, okay? That's what PO stands means payoff, okay? Contract for deeds, you know, if it's non-performing, you're probably going to pay 30 to 60% either the lesser UPB or fair market value. If they're performing, it goes back to that with equity with 80 to 95 cents on the dollar. Junior liens like seconds overpriced just currently due to lack of inventory and then the equity. A lot of these houses that had first and seconds, the values have come back because they used to sell the seconds cheap because there was they were over encumbered. Now they're under encumbered means they're more equity than the value is worth. Okay. Commercial is totally going to vary by cap rates, asset class, what's going on with that asset and what state it's in. Okay. You're going to submit a bid usually as a percentage of UPB minus taxes owed. Okay. That's what you're, how you're going to submit your bid. And submit the bid is easy as sending an email in or send a spreadsheet. If you're making an offer off a spreadsheet, pretty simple to do. Okay. Now, when it comes to the stair step method, okay, this is not meant to be hard or fast. It's a, if somebody doesn't give you a price, this is a rough guy to go by. Doesn't mean it's law. I'm always amazed. Well, do you still, why you shouldn't bid off the stair step? Look, if nobody's going to give you, this is if there's negative equity. Now, if they owe more than the property is worth. Okay. If it's, if the house is worth 30 and they owe more than 30, I wouldn't offer more than 25% of the fair market value. So if it's a $30,000 house, that means what are you offering? 7,500 bucks. Okay. You have to protect your investments. If it's 30 to 40, 35% of fair market value. Remember, this means they owe more than the property's worth. In the 40s, 45%. It's in the 50s, 55. Anything really over 50 um, to 60, 65%, especially if you're buying the best asset, probably around 65%. Remember, this is where they owe more than the property's worth. You're going to adjust this. If it's almost a, uh, if they start a foreclosure process, and it's almost an REO. They're like in the last 90 days to foreclosure process. You probably got to be closer to 70 cents on the dollar. If it's in pristine condition, probably closer to 70 cents on the dollar, all right? If it's a longer foreclosure process, like New York, New Jersey, and haven't started it, then you can take it down by 5%. Remember, you, you should deduct your taxes and look at your taxes owed at the county before you make your offer, okay? But this is just a rough pricing model. If they give you a price that they're looking for, then that's the first thing to go off of, okay? And then it's pretty easy to run the numbers and see what makes sense, but I always laugh at these people that don't make a lot of offers or there. There's some folks out there that, oh, you can't make it off of stairs. When, when, when are you buying stuff? I always laugh because most of these people, these yahoos, aren't buying anything. They're not looking at anything. And you got to have some sort of model. Like if somebody sends you a list, they say the highest and best. Okay, let me run some numbers here. If you want to get rid of this low value stuff, I've got to buy it at a price that protects my money, protects my investors. It's one of the hardest fast rules. You protect your assets. CYA, cover your assets, okay? Well, do I make some lowball offers sometimes? Yeah, but I'm not going to come up and pay 65 or 90 cents on the dollar for a crappy little asset. Just doesn't make sense often. And this isn't, if there's equity, it's a whole different ball game. If, you know, like I said, if there's equity, you got to expect to pay 80 to 90. Does that mean I'm going to buy it? No, it doesn't mean I'm going to buy a lot sometimes, okay? Now, as a note investor, this is going to go away. Being the bank is a different mindset than being a property investor, a fixed and flipper. If you're coming from that model, 
you probably didn't want occupied assets, right? You wanted it vacant so you can get in there, clean it up and do all that work and sell it. I don't want that. I want occupied assets. The reason you want occupied assets is they're usually in better shape. Okay, yes, you're gonna have to replace paint and carpet most of the time, do some clean out. But they're occupied, especially when it's cold outside. Guess what? Somebody's probably keeping the heat on. Okay, so the pipes don't burst. The copper goblins don't show up. There's more exit strategies. You can get it modified or reinstatement or even have the borrower work with like local communities, get bailouts in some cases. Um, it's easier to reinstate and modify. It's easier to do a deed in lieu or cash for keys if it's occupied. Uh, emotional equity. What I mean by that, somebody's living in a house. It's easier to have a conversation like, listen, so do you move in and moving your kids and having to pay all these down payments and deposits? Just stay and put that money towards your back payments. Let's work to keep you in the house, okay? Uh, there's also less capital expenditures because if it's occupied, somebody's taking care of the house, so the plumbing's probably working, electrical's still working. Doesn't mean you're going to have to fix some things from time to time, but it's a whole lot in capital, less in capital expenditures and the opportunity to get the bar back on track through a payment plan, a modification works to cash flow coming in immediately versus dragging it out and foreclosing and going that route. Now, if it's a vacant asset, your options are basically to foreclose or if you can track down the borrower, get them to sign a deed in lieu or a friendly foreclosure. They sign the property where you can walk away or it's a consent to judgment if there's a second mortgage on the property. You still got to get that consent from the borrower. That will speed up the foreclosure to wipe out that second. Okay? But that's one of the most important things about is you know, pick and, that, and that's part of why I encourage you to pick up the phone and call me and schedule a call. I see Jim's already booked a call on Tuesday at noon, roughly one o'clock. Um, talk with scottcarson.com to talk about markets, talk about states you're interested in. I'll, I'll gladly spend some time with you guys to say, Hey, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Where are you going to find the best amount of luck and help you get the ball rolling for it? Because it can be very intimidating when you get a note in or you get a spreadsheet in. And it's got 100 or 200 assets all across the country. Like, what do I start? Where do I begin? Are all these deals or are all they duds? My goal is to help you clear that up so you can buy more assets and be smart about it. Okay? Let's move on. Are there, and for, are there any questions before we move on to the next session? The next session is something that you guys are all going to love. I mean, if you haven't liked this so far, can I get a thumbs up? A hell yeah, if you've enjoyed this so far today. Spending your Saturday with me. I mean, what else are you do? You're going to watch NFL playoffs till later this afternoon. So you might as well get a little educated uh, to take advantage of what's going on out there right now. <laughs> All right, moving on. All right, one of the most important things to understand, too, when you're as a note investor is how do you fund a note deal? Now, you're not going to go down and get a hard money loan from a hard money lender to buy a note. That might happen 1% of the time. Most of the time, because you're buying the debt. There's already a mortgage on the property. So a hard money lender doesn't want to be in a second lien position on a property. They want to be in the first lien, right? Well, if you're buying a note, that doesn't work for them. Now, I don't understand why they don't understand that they can do other things with it. But most hard money lenders want to make points. They want to make the difference in the yield spread premium. I mean, in the yield between what they're paying their investors for the note versus what the note is paying. That's why we're at 12, 14 paying 8%, okay, to their investors. And notes are going to be usually going to be longer in 6 to 12 months. It's usually a longer process of 24 to 36 months. So you're going to need cash in a lot of cases. Now, a bank is not going to give you a loan to go buy a note, okay? How do you pay for a note? Basically, cash, wire transfers, okay? You're not going to show up at a bank with a, a box full of cash. You know, I had one guy do that one time. Show up with like fifty thousand dollars in cash, and I'm like, dude, I can't take this. I can't invest. I need it in cash. Well, can you put it in your account? And walk? I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, we need to. You know, I, I don't think you're good to invest with. Okay. Guy ran a uh, dispensary <laughs> and a lot of cash. You're gonna basically send in a wire transfer to a bank, and you're either use like if you've got a personal business line of credit, you can use that. Basically, you use uh, uh, if you, you're looking to do that, you've been in business for a while. Check out uh, my buddy Merrill Chandler at GetFundable.com. They do a great job of helping business owners, entrepreneurs get their personal and business credit lined up and getting lines of credit evade. I think he's helped some students get over a million dollars in lines of credit for them to fund deals. Okay. And just phenomenal. Great guy. Check out getfundablebootcamp.com. I really think it's a required two day course that you should watch uh, at least once a year. Okay. But most of the time you're going to use OPM. If you don't have your own funds, yes, you can use your IRA account to, Pay for it, sure can. 
But most of the time, you're probably going to use OPM, other people's money, other money's, people's retirement accounts, other people's checking and savings if you don't have the funds yourself. Now, self-directed IRA, you can use Roth or traditional. You can use a civil 401k, a SEP IRA, a self-directed health savings account if you qualify for one of those. If you have an ESA for your kids, you know, you put away two grand a year for you. You can use all these self-directed IRA accounts to fund deals or to invest in notes, okay? And check out this video link that talks more about the self-directed IRA types. Of course, you can just Google all the different self-directed IRA types and they'll show you out there, okay? Uh, if you use, if you want to open a self-directed account, go to rocketdollar.com and use the code NOTECAMP. It'll give you a discount code on setting up your self-directed IRA. Now, these uh, limits have changed. I need to update the slide. These are the 2023 limits. They're now up to 7,000 for traditional IRA and a Roth. I believe this HSA stayed the same. Um, and so you just Google 2024 contributions, okay? Now, there's other ways to fund a note deal. And you can use collateral from your note and, and, and collateralize the loan documents as collateral. It's called a collateral assignment. Or you can take existing notes that you have coming in and take the collateral and they can hold the collateral for leverage and give you a note. Now, some, some hard money lenders do. They'll create loans and they'll go do a collateral assignment to a bank for their existing loan to get half that money back to go out and lend more money. Okay. Um, the funder holds the note file or other notes to provide uh, the, the capital for. A UCC-1 is filed in the county for the, the LLC. One of the things that we do uh, differently, a little different, <clears throat> is if the, we're borrowing money from an investor and we're buying a note, there's an assignment of mortgage that's recorded. Okay, That's what transfers the ownership of the note. So we'll, if the bar, if the, not the funder, the bar is the same, right? But if a funding source say that Jim Shibley comes over and he wants to put 50K into a deal, we're going to buy a note in Ohio. We're going to give Jim a 8% return, 9% return, whatever. To secure his investment, we may have him codenamed on the assignment. So it would say uh, ABC Bank assigns to uh, Scott Carson LLC 50% interest and 50% interest to Jim Shibley LLC. So he's co-named in the county records. He sees he's got interest in that. That's the one way to secure. You could also create an LLC if the investor is going to put like 250 or more with you. And then you, you can go that route. Um, I will, you can do a loan against another property. If you've got a property that's, you know, got a ton of equity, slap a second lien on that property and use it as collateral to help fund that first. Okay. You can also sell, if you've got a performing loan, you could sell a partial chunk of payments off to pay for a new loan. Partials are the most over uh, exaggerated deal in note investing. Does it happen? Yes, it happens. But it happens in a much smaller amount than it does with tradition. You're not going to buy a partial note from a bank. You're going to buy, they're going to want to buy and sell the whole thing. Okay. If you're buying, if you've got an investor who's got a chunk of change and wants partners, doesn't want to make an eight or nine percent, but they want to get half the profits, then you would need to start a new LLC with that investor. Make sure you're 51% ownership and he's 49%, he or she's 49%, so you control everything. And then you go to the operating agreement that outlines the activities in the LLC and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and then your, or your investor can just fund your LLC and you can sell them the shares out of your LLC for the specific note deal. Okay. And will a bank give me a note loan? No, banks will not lend on notes. Smaller banks may do collateral assignments and some of the stuff if you got other notes. I already talked about hard money lending. We'll do sometimes up to 50% on a collateral assignment for new. Now, on some, some banks on commercial notes, this is just for commercial notes, okay? If it's usually if it's a million dollar plus, some banks will carry the financing on a commercial note. They'll just reassign it, or even sometimes they'll even joint venture with you on a commercial deal if it's an ugly asset. But instead of you had to bring the full amount, <clears throat> some of them will only say, hey, bring 20% to the table. Especially if the borrower on the underlying asset has walked away, you're gonna take over uh, ownership of the asset or control the 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 hotel or the apartment complex. They don't want to lose a performing note, but they don't want a, a non-performing of the book, so they may transfer it from the non-performing side to the performing side, and that is pretty cool. <coughs> We've helped a couple of our students do that. That's always kind of rewarding. Uh, but you've got to have a team and or experience with the assets that that, that will do that uh, to help manage that stuff. Okay. Uh, they Like I said, they may require a, a percentage of down payment, 20% of what the funding amount, 10% in some cases. We actually helped one of our, our students get 0% down. They were just wanting to get off the non-performing side, the performing side to take over. I want to say it was like 12 duplexes, 20 properties at one point that she was doing. So 
So keep them on there. Now, hard money lenders, they won't lend on notes. I, I can't reiterate as much, but they may have notes available for sale. Okay. The most of their notes are six to 12 months. So you're going to usually be buying at par, but it could be a 12 to 14% return on investment. Like I said, they want to control the asset. Uh, they make their money on the points and the churn, but they may, I see a lot of hard money loans are trying to recoup their uh, cash flows because they have stuff out. And they're wanting stuff. And now they they probably most of them want to retain service. And that's up to you. I mean, these are shorter term loans. If you're happy making a 10 10 to 12 percent uh on your money for a year or six months, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? It's not a bad bit bad deal to do. Um, especially if you got cheap funds. Not if you're using somebody else's funds, uh it's good. Now I've bought non-performing notes from hard money lenders where they had to foreclose on the asset. And sometimes you'll run some deals like that. It's, that works out pretty well, okay? Uh, what else do I add to the funding? When you're funding the purchase of a note, you also want to add some things to that amount so that you're covered. So you don't have to go back and forth to the investor to fund deals. Like I will, you should always look at uh, property taxes. If back taxes are owed, add those to the amount. If it's a performing note and the borrower is paying the taxes, you're good. You don't have to add that, okay? Um, you need to add the cost for a BPO, a broker price opinion, or like I just put an appraisal number in there about 200 to 400 bucks okay it can cost you money to do that uh, make sure you always put eyes on an asset before closing having somebody drive by the asset take photos there's a company that we use we'll talk more about them later on uh, you want to budget in your foreclosure workout servicing costs like i said uh, if it's a non-judicial state we'll add uh, 3500 for foreclosure and 1500 for servicing that's five grand if it's a longer judicial process, a year or longer, we'll do five thousand for foreclosure and fifteen hundred dollars. So it's anywhere from five to sixty-five hundred we add on the deal, depending on that. So if, it's, if we've got to start that process, if they're already most of the way through it, the foreclosure costs may have already been covered and taken care of. Um, you always got to figure in some cost to clean out paint and carpet. You know, add it in there. Um, Force place insurance is getting expensive in some areas. Always want to figure that in if it's not being paid. Um, there's maybe utility, HOA, code enforcement liens that don't go away or get reduced. Some states that get reduced, you got to figure that in. If they don't go away, then you've got to add that in as being paid. You, now, some of that can be paid out when you sell the asset. But if you're looking uh, in some states, you may want to go ahead and pay off the HOA, the COA lien, so they're not foreclosing and wiping you out. And then we throw on $500 to $1,000 in marketing costs or an asset manager fee along the way. Because you got to realize, if you're looking at 20 bids, 20 assets and you're going through due diligence to find one, two, three good ones for your investor, there's a time, your, your time is worth something. So don't be afraid to add a little bit extra on to cover your marketing costs along the way. Now, if you don't use the four whole 6,500, guess what? You borrowed it, you're paying back. It's like an interest-free loan for you um, for that money that you're not paying taxes on, okay? When you add these numbers up, you always want to try to stay below 65% of the as is fair market value, providing they owe more. Than the assets worth, right? Or oh, close to what it is. But that's the thing. Make sure you're you're below seventy percent of usually the fair market value, so that it leaves your room. If you do have to foreclose, you got plenty of room to foreclose and then sell it and still make some money. Okay. One thing, if you remember, there are five things that are going to be protect your investor, and you want to get in the habit of sharing these things. Okay, five things that protect your investor. The first thing. We're only going to buy first liens. That's one of the big things. You're always going to be in the driver's seat. The only thing that might be out is taxes, okay? And guess what? You're going to pay the taxes, okay? You're going to buy below 70% of as-is value. So you're buying an asset where there's equity. Or you get, you make your equity by buying at a discount. You're going to use servicing companies, attorneys to collect and foreclose. It's not you going out knocking and collecting. You have higher professionals that do that heavy lifting for you. If the insurance is not paid, you're gonna put insurance on it so it's an act of God. It doesn't wipe you out, okay? And that's either gonna be reimbursed by the uh, the borrower or it's gonna cause you the, give you the right to foreclose. And then of course you're checking title, collateral files, making sure there's stuff on there that can't bump you up but you still have the right to foreclose and you're gonna have professionals check that out, okay? So those are the five biggest things that are protecting your investor. Okay, buy only first liens, buying below value, using professionals to collect or foreclose, insurance case and act of God, and then always checking title and collateral files. And you're not going to fund until these things 
till the, 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 the title's clear for you, okay? That's the most important thing to keep in mind there that protects your investor and protects their investment. Any questions about that before moving on to, to finding investors? All right, our next session is probably going to be one of the most important facets of this because what you're going to learn in session seven on finding investors, you can apply this to every bit of real estate investing that you're doing, okay? And I've seen people, literally what I'm going to share with you in the next 10, 20 minutes, people charge 1500 or 2000 bucks, And you'll be blown away by how simple it is to find investors in your backyard or in states and counties all across the country, okay? Now... Finding investors to fund your deals is one of the most important things. I don't care. Kudos to you. You're going to need to raise capital to do this long term. Okay. Now you can always go to real estate investment clubs and meet up groups and network with other people there, but those are also going to be real estate investors like yourself. They're sharks, right? We don't want to make it, we don't want anything less than 12 or 20%, right? You can jump on LinkedIn and connect with asset managers. I'm necessarily not asset managers, but note investors, private investors. Real estate investors is a way to raise capital as well. Keywords, LinkedIn groups, and then also looking at profiles. You can jump up on connected investor. You can jump on bigger pockets. Uh, we've got a strategy for bigger pockets that works really, really well. It's like shooting fish in the barrel to raise capital because people on there will literally tell you they got fifty to one hundred k to invest. But we'll share that with our we share that with our three day workshop. Okay. Um, okay. We we target keywords or fifty k to invest, seventy five k to invest, hundred k to invest, and then we send our pitch deck video. We'll talk more about that class. Okay. Um, self-directed IRA or self-directed trustees holds events. Like there's an IRA conference taking place in Dallas later this year. Um, you know, check with your local self-directed IRA company. and we'll see what they have. They may have networking events, lunch and learns, meetups, all that good stuff are great stuff to go to. I like make it easy. Can I make it easy for you? Should we do this to show you the show you the way, the truth and the light? Finding investors on public records is so simple. It's easy. You just got to build, you just got to follow along on what we teach, okay? If you use Netra Online, netronline.com, this is going to take you to a main website that's basically taking all the county record, uh, county recorders, county appraisal districts. You go to Netra Online, click on official public records. It pulls up a map of the state. You click on the map. Pick the state and then you pick the county in and then you go. And then, like I said, this is a free free tool, free website to get access all county websites. It's phenomenal, okay? The county appraisal districts, the county clerk or the recorder's offices, those are the two most important things, okay? You're also going to use Detra Online like to check taxes on a property and check who owns it, some other stuff during your due diligence process, but we'll get that later on. What I like is if somebody has used their IRA to either buy a property or lend on a property, you're going to find it at the appraisal district or the county clerk. All right. Uh, and you're going to search when you go to, we'll just say the county appraisal district. Now, here's the thing. Let me, let me, let me reiterate this. If you're in California, Arizona, uh, Maryland, Virginia, or Minnesota, you can't go to the county appraisal district and type in a name. Like I would have you, if you're in Texas or any of those other states, you could go, you can just go to like Bear County or Travis County or Hamilton County, Ohio, pull up the appraisal website and type in Equity Trust or Quest Trust. And it'll pull up a whole list, especially in the appraisal district, of people who have used their IRA to buy a piece of property. You can click on it and you can literally see their name, their mail and address. That's like shooting fish in the barrel to mail out a postcard or a letter to them. And that's one thing we work with in our one-on-one -on -one coaching is how to contact these investors to get them to fund with you, to get them to work with you. Because it's literally everybody that has a self-directed IRA is usually pretty smart. They're looking to invest. And guess what? Notes are the ideal passive income, passive investment for people with an IRA. They can't go out and mow the lawn, fix it up. It's got to be passive. And notes are in roughly, oh, I think most IRA companies say somewhere around 30 to 50% of what they have under management is going into notes. There's also about 30 30% uh, of the funds that they have in IRA companies is sitting there making zero. So it's a great way for you to reach out to. Now, if somebody's lent money to another investor, you would go to the county recorder's office. Now, you can search by name in the county recorder's office. Some states, you might have to register for it or pay a small fee to search, but it's well worth it to pull a list once or twice 
that gives you 200, 300 names, who they lent the money to, their address, their mail address that you can reach out to and actually see how much they lent out when it comes to county report. Okay. Uh, this is easy. So once again, if you go to the, the county appraisal districts, there's literally 50 different plus self-directed IRA companies, Equity Trust, Penscom, Mid-Atlantic, um, Rocket Dollar, uh, Mountain View. There's all, a whole bunch of them. Okay. I like in like in Texas here where I'm at, you know, the two biggest ones that we search that have done probably the best job of marketing is Equity Trust is the biggest and Quest has probably done another second best. Okay. If you just search for Equity Trust or Quest Trust, it'll pull up Equity Trust for the benefit of Jim. Uh, Quest Trust for the benefit of IRA, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. May not give you a name of the investor. That's fine. All you need is to know the name and then the mailing address needs to be separate from the actual physical address of Quest or Equity Trust. Find the mail addresses. Some counties will allow you to do a down, a, a, hit a button to download the mailing list. It's easy. And then guess what? You, you send a letter. All right. You can go Google. If it gives you the account holder names on there instead of, a, a you know, instead of just Equity Trust or just IRA one two three four five six seven. Still send it to them. Send it to the mail and address of the property, and just change your investor to Equity Trust or Quest Trust client. Okay, but if it gives you a name, guess what? You can usually go in the county appraisal district, search by that person that investor's name, and it'll pull up other real estate they own. Easy, easy aspect of things. And then we'll also take it a separate step with our uh, our VAs. We'll take those names. Actually, when we find a first and last name. And we'll go Google them, jump on white pages, jump on LinkedIn, do a skip trace to find emails and phone numbers of those people. And it's literally an, an easy way to, for you to raise capital and, and raise a million dollars in 90 days. And we'll mail out a letter, we'll mail out a postcard, we'll contact on social media. We do a variety of things to do this. We go a lot more in depth on this in day two of our three-day workshop. And we also spend a big chunk of time on this. Uh, these are some of the, the things that we're we'll talking about with our uh, WC and crew members or monthly memberships as well on a weekly basis. Okay. And we share postcards, sample letters, what we do in getting the word out to people. Now, county clerk, this is a recorder's office. This is where people are filing deeds. You can do a deed search on the recorder's office. Um, and uh, same thing, you search for the, the company name, it'll pull up either Equity Trust, Quest Trust. You can do both the uh, grantee, grantor, mortgagee, mortgagor search on this stuff here. It, once it, it should give you a mail address, cross-reference the mail address, make sure it's not equity trust request mail address. But I'll tell you how much they lent the borrower. That's the beautiful thing. It'll give you an investor name that they lent the money to, how much they lent. Uh, you can also do a, a, a release of lien search. And that shows you people who have gotten paid back now have money to search for. Now, one of the things too, ladies and gentlemen, is your, this is a side trick. We talked about a foreclosure list previously, right? If you look at the foreclosure list, a lot of times you'll see Equity Trust or Quest Trust or something like that foreclosing. It's, it's an IRA investor who's foreclosing on a deal that they may have some money to reach out to. And once again, what do we do? We mail a letter or postcard, we do a mail merge, we contact them on social media, and then we rinse and repeat. And this is how we raise millions of dollars and our students are raising millions of dollars on a regular basis uh, for deal flow, okay? Cal Ewing just raised 200 grand. Uh, John Gore raised a hundred grand. Uh, Keith Holland raised four million bucks. You know this works. It's 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 much easier than just sending out to people that have an IRA neutral or have a four hundred one k. They may not be real estate investors, may not enter this process, understand the process. But those people that have a self directed IRA account with Equity Trust, Quest, Pensco for real estate or note purposes, they understand it. You don't have to educate them. It's a much easier conversation because they're investors just like you. They're looking for deals and we got money to invest. So it's really the perfect trinity for you to reach out to them uh, to have them potentially fund or partner with you on deals. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on, ladies and gentlemen? Because I know that's a this is one of the most valuable aspects of it. And to be surprised how few people understand or know this. And really, nobody else really teaches this out there. A few places on stuff like that. But most of the other note people, they don't teach this. They don't teach you how to raise capital. They don't teach you how to market you got to understand that's an important thing in today's world. It's not just about finding deals. you got to be able to fund them and market for them as well. All right? You are not beholden to one guy or one gal sending you notes, and that's it. It's just not a smart thing to be. Okay? Now, you can. Um, there are a couple places you can go out and buy custom lists of contacts, of asset managers, or even IRA owners. Okay? Now, 
like Melissa data, exact data two sources that we use. You can actually reach out and say, hey, I want to buy a list of IRA owners. Okay. And they'll just give you a generic list. And that's not going to tell you if it's with uh, Scott Trade or Schwab or AG Edwards or like Equity Trust. They're just somebody who has an IRA. Now you can filter it down, say, hey, I want somebody who has at least 150K or more, and then pick the city, state, or county, which is kind of nice. Okay. You can also purchase lists of employees with companies, a little bit like a B2B list. That can be well, but they'll give you their name, address, email, and phone number a lot of times. Phone number, eh. You're not going to be uh, using that a lot, but the phone, I'm sorry, the email and the name and the address is a valuable thing. We, Melissa Data, exactdata.com. Um, you can order customized lists. They usually want the list to be somewhere around a $1,000 minimum order. And you, you're going to pay somewhere between six to 14 cents a lead for the residential stuff. If you're buying uh, employee names from a company, it's like 25 cents per lead. So if you're buying $1,000 at around six cents, that's like a 16 thousand leads that takes a while for you to upload that to your database okay but it's still about an eight to ten eight to ten percent open rate and can be faster uh for you to reach out but you just got to expect that it's more generic they don't understand may not be invested in real estate they may not um, be interested in real estate okay so that's one thing this is why you get a better hit rate and for a thousand bucks you can sure as hell send a lot of postcards and letters to ira investors and raise a million dollars in 90 days okay now where can you post post deals one of the best things for you to raise capital is to post deals from past experience, fix and flips you've done, note deals you've done, um, wholesale deals, post in of other places, post deals from others, case studies. One thing we teach all the time, like, listen, people want to see you posting about real estate. They're attracted people doing something. If you haven't got a lot of experience, guess what? There's plenty of other case studies to talk about. Post deals that you're working on, post deals that you're doing some due diligence on. But when you're talking about note investing and raising capital, never mention safe or guaranteed. Those are two words that will get you in trouble. Uh, it's very valuable for you to create a short pitch deck video, we call it. It's like 10 minute long video talking about what your focus is, what you're investing in, the types of deals you're doing, and the advantage, the pros and cons of those deals, okay? Talk about your vendors, talk about your team. This is one of the easiest things to get people uh, to build a rapport with you. Go have them watch a 10 minute pitch deck video, make it on your website or when you're emailing out people or posting or sending out postcards or letters to investors, put a, a QR code or a link for them to go to to watch your pitch video. And it, it, it helps you to have a ton of conversations with a lot of people and those that are interested that take the next step to connect with you. That uh, makes it easy. Now, qualifying investors is just important because not everybody is somebody you want to invest with or have them invest with you. You have to ask, are they currently investing in real estate? They are, great. If they're not, or never invested in real estate, not a good fit. Are they accredited or sophisticated? Are they a professional investor, okay? How much are they looking to invest is one of the questions you've got to have. Now, we've got a whole, like, four-step process that we recommend following. There's a video out there that we did on Note Night in America about a four-step process. Check it out at weclosenotes.tv. But you got to ask that question, really, how much are they looking to invest? How much are they looking to put to work? Because it's a big difference between five grand and 50 grand. 50 grand, you do something with, Five grand, you can't do anything, okay? How long are they looking to invest? You know, are they looking to invest for a couple of years they come from that, or are they looking for like 90 days? Are they active or passive? If they're passive, they're looking for a flat rate return. If they're active, they may want a higher return because that's they're in the business of being an investor. What kind of returns are they looking for? When it tells you 20%, then they need to go do it themselves. If they're passive and they want to make 20%, then they're not a fit for you, okay? A passive investor should get somewhere like 6 to 8 maybe 10%, okay? Uh, an active investor is probably going to want more, and they may not be a fit for what you're doing. We use an investor uh, investment questionnaire. We provide that in our three-day workshop to help you qualify people, help walk through that process, and it's really, really valuable. you got to have an investment questionnaire sometime to help filter through people. Okay, Now, there are investors you want to avoid, people unfamiliar with real estate, people wanting short-term or real high ROIs that don't make sense. Really, investments below 50 grand. When you start off, you're probably going to get some friends and family, stuff like that, to bring 25 grand. Okay, that's fine. Put them in a deal. But as you get going, you're going to want to increase that amount, minimum investment up to 50 to 100K. It just means you're dealing with more sophisticated people. Uh, pay attention. Do people talk bad about others? They talk bad about politics. They bash everybody. Ask for referrals, okay? Uh, if it, also, if they're in a suit, that's one thing. Have you sued anybody? There's, if they're suit happy, you probably don't want to deal with them. Ask for references, past partners they've worked with or deals they funded, CPA, attorney, banker, stuff like that. That's fine. We'll gladly let you uh, uh, review, have them review the funding agreements, review the deal flow. 
the big thing I always like to ask people is if you're going to ask, if you need to see stuff, does, is your CPAs, your attorney, or is your banker familiar with note investing? If they're not familiar, why would you go ask for counsel or advice from somebody who's not familiar? Okay. And the deal, they're just going to completely botch the whole aspect of it because they don't understand. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. Well, my banker told me I shouldn't do it. Why? Are they familiar with it? You're, are they doing real estate? Well, no. Then why are you taking somebody's counsel? I mean, advice is like assholes. Everybody has one. Okay. What you got to realize is you want to seek counsel from somebody who understands investing. And then maybe other note investors, maybe other real estate investors, not you're just your local CP and account who has or, or attorney or whatever that may not have it any experience in whatsoever, okay? Always, always, always require investors that you're going to fund with to A, fill out the investment questionnaire or profile sheet, send you a pledge letter or email, which is basically, hey, Scott, um, I'm sending along my proof of funds that shows half a million in my bank account. I'm pledging 50K or 100K for you for 24 months to do some deals. They won't return these items, ladies and gentlemen. They're not going to fund, okay? They can talk a good game, but they're not going to return them in a timely process they're just not going to deal with you okay um if the reason you also ask them to fill out these things is figure out where the money's coming from if it's coming from schwab or uh chase they're gonna have to open up a self-directed ira account with a self-directed ira custodian because chase is gonna let them invest in a note or a property you gotta put it that money and roll it over to a uh equity trust or something like that they can allow that stuff for it it takes if they're if they got money sitting in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, it takes three days to trade out of that into cash, and then another day to wire, and then it takes about a week to open up an account. Now, you can open up an account without a big deposit. You can open just throw you know fifty bucks in the account, equity trust, something like that. They're doing a rollover. It can take a couple of weeks. So keep in mind uh, where the money's come from and the timing for that. And this is important. Okay, have a paperwork created that you're doing the funding agreements created by attorney. Allow, I'm glad to allow a CPA or attorneys to review the documents. Always use agreements. It outlines when things go wrong. Never do a handshake funding. Most investors out there can't make 6% or greater right now. Still to this day, okay? If they're not making that right now, don't give them that, okay? If they're making 1%, 2% in a CD, then give them 4%. You get what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? If their money's making zero, 6% is above average return. I mean, all the markets and interest rates have changed. Okay, if somebody was making 6%, they probably want to make 8 or 10 now. That's fine. I would not go above 12. And the 12 would only do short term for the most part. Okay. Now, when it comes to making payments to your investors in communication, when we make some payments out, we do it quarterly. We avoid monthly payments. It gets too expensive with a wire and too much paper. We do it quarterly basis. We set up an online portal for tracking and you know, for tracking and help, like Basecamp or Box, something they can see, have access to, Slack. Uh, keep Google Sheets, use something. Never pull investors' money together. It's always going to be one investor funding one asset. Now, you can have one investor fund three assets and another investor fund another one. That's fine. But never have one investor, more than one investor fund one asset. If you did that, you need to go create a, get a, um, do a private placement and put a fund together for it. Trust your instincts. If somebody gives you the heebie jeebies or just don't like it, don't fund with them. Don't work with them. It's great to be friends, but if you get somebody who's an asshole or pain in the ass, it will be your worst nightmare. And that's one of the biggest things that I wish I had done was not have a few folks fund some deals that were pain in the asses. Okay. Any questions about funding before we move on to some of the marketing ways uh, to get things done? And we talked about finding deals. We talked about funding deals. One of the things that falls in line to help you fund or find deals is marketing deals. And the note marketing side is very important to note business. It's a little bit different. You don't have the, especially when you don't have the MLS to go find deals. It's a different animal. And it's okay. It's a okay. The great thing is if you're willing to do things that others aren't, you're going to find better deals and be more profitable. Okay. 
And marketing is one of those things that will set you apart from the crowd. And remember, 80% of sales are made after the fifth contact. Keep that in mind. Expect to post and market regularly and often. You can automate your postings to socials through Buffer.com or Hootsuite. I, I prefer Buffer. Um, Hootsuite's getting a little bit more expensive these days. But this is these are two websites that if you go in and, and post your things on there, you can actually pick and pre-post what gets sent out to social media posts and your profiles. There are three of the most three of the most important things to use in today's 21st century 24, 24 marketing. And that is email. You got to have an email CRM. I prefer keep, keep set up landing pages and calendar links and all that stuff in one place. See who's open your email, send a custom lists, all that good stuff. Number two is LinkedIn. You got to have a LinkedIn account and you can use octopus CRM.io to help you with it growing your, your database, growing your audience on there by automating your reach out and connections and stuff like that. It's so well worth it, okay? It helps us grow from 6,000 to 30,000 connections in a few years, okay? See, video marketing. YouTube at the minimum, you of course can use video, what you use on YouTube across all the other social media platforms. They all want you to use video too anyway. And by video marketing, we're not talking like you have to do like hour long, two hour long conference calls. You could do like what Cal is doing, and doing like a note deal of the week. He's like doing a 30 minute webinar and uploading it to YouTube and other places. You could pull out your phone and do short little videos, walk around properties you're rehabbing or properties you've flipped. Just get in the habit of sharing some content, the note term of the day or the deal of the day or what you're working on. Part of why we're so successful is because we embrace video. All right. Embraced it and started using it a little bit each day goes a long way. Plus, it's 24-hour day, 365 day a week advertising for your business. And it's it's free. It doesn't cost you anything to upload video. It just takes a little time. And a lot, if you go and look at other people, you just have to make it a prior to do every day. And that's one of the things I try to do is make sure we post something on a daily basis to attract buyers, sellers, and funding sources. Because everybody is a buyer, seller, or funding source. Okay. I've had people this morning alone who came from a video we posted on LinkedIn or posted TikTok or YouTube. All right, most of you have been following me that are watching this and follow me for a few months or a few years in some cases for those of you out there. Probably came across a podcast or a video to do it. And we're not talking, you got to be creative. Just start sharing some things. It will go a long way and you will get better at what you do. Now, email marketing, it's a number one percent ROI for marketing. Seriously, you get a forty-four dollar return on every dollar you spend. That's why it's a forty-four hundred percent return. Okay. Now, remember, we talked about this. There's using you can use Keep, Aweber, Mailchimp's okay. Um, there's other platforms out there, but we're, you're going to at least use email in your business to market out to bankers and investors. Your warm list of people, and you're probably going to send emails out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I like sending an email out to my warm market on Sunday nights too, to get people to pay attention to what we have going on that week. Um, you're going to email at least once a week out to your investor database, at least once a week. Okay. Not once a month, once a week, at least. Okay. Now, what do I talk about? I talk about a variety of things you can do when you're starting off. You talk about happy holidays because it's all every month has a holiday in it. If your database is more local, you could say, Hey, I'm going out to the local meetup group or a networking event or conference. You can talk about a personal event. Hey, I'm going out. My son uh, won the wrestling competition, or we went out and went on a holiday somewhere. We shared. The idea is your posting is literally building rapport with people long term. They get to know you and follow you. And then the last but not least, because there's four weeks in every month, roughly, post about something, a past deal or a current deal. It, people love to see case studies of what you're working on. It gives something to talk about. And it ain't going to be anything fancy. It'd be a short, really less than 20 lines in your email that goes out. Hey, what are you working on? Here's what we got going on this week. Okay, something like that. You're going to email asset managers, like I said, once or twice a month too, to get the ball rolling on that. So email marketing is one of the most important things. And you can, want to, you can start off pretty cheap. I, we're spending 700, 800 to 1,000 bucks in email marketing per month because it is such a big thing that drives us for finding asset managers and connecting the dots with not only our education side, but also our deal flow side, okay? LinkedIn, you got to learn to leverage this. If you're not spending time on LinkedIn, you're in the dark ages. And most of you are in the dark ages. Most of you are like cavemen when it comes to where you're at in social. Every one of you, okay, for the most part. A few of you aren't, 
But the first thing you need to do is go complete your profile and spend 100% and make sure it's complete 100%. That means filling in, putting in photos for your smiling face, your header images with your LLCs, that kind of stuff. It's literally your social media business resume. Now, people ask me all the time, well, Scott, I do something else. Do I need to start a separate LinkedIn profile? No, you don't need to start a separate profile. If you're worried about your boss or HR, guess what? Go block them. Okay. Now, if, you're bought, if your job is providing 401k and benefits and you usually need to file out an outside business agreement, an OBA in a lot of cases, then you may not be able to talk about enough. Maybe just talk about your, your hobby, but go put something on your profile that, hey, I'm an, also an active real estate investor as a hobbyist. Okay. Banks asset managers realize a lot of investors are part-time. That's okay. So put that below, but just say something about you being a real estate investor as well. Okay. It's easy to find investors, bankers, real other real estate investors, note funders on LinkedIn. Like I said, octopuscrm.io for 21 bucks a month that can help you automate to connect with 20 to 100 people per day or the right type of connections, okay? Only 3% of LinkedIn users post daily. So post there on a daily basis, a photo, an article. One of the things that we've been doing sharing little articles with our WC and crew members so they can share that to their network, you know, help prime the pump to get people start paying attention in a variety of different articles. What's great about LinkedIn, all these social media platforms have a algorithm, right? Like really probably less than 1% of your Facebook connections see your stuff, maybe 5% of the most. LinkedIn's better, probably closer to about 10%, 15%. Because here's what I would say. We started a LinkedIn newsletter uh, a year, over a year ago. And we quickly got to about 4,000 subscribers. Well, if I've got 30,000 connections on LinkedIn, and we've got roughly 4,500 to just under 5,000 subscribers, that's about 15%. So I'll take that. It's a great way to connect with people and get in their inbox as well, okay? Join and post a group, start a newsletter. Uh, LinkedIn will allow you to upload some lists, like up to 500 or 1,000 people, emails, and they'll go out and find, see if those people have a LinkedIn profile and connect with it, okay? Video marketing, I know this is what most people are going to avoid, but you've got to realize if you're sharing to YouTube, it's the second largest search engine and it prioritizes video first then. <clears throat> it's owned by Google, right? So Google prioritizes video than just ads, okay? We use TubeBuddy to help us grow. Short videos do well, minute, two minutes. Um, if you do a, vid a, a video, a longer form video, 10 minutes do well, because now YouTube can post two ads in there and they like to prioritize that versus something with less than 10 minutes. We got a lot of long form videos, contents, webinars, stuff like that. But it literally, part about having YouTube is making sure you got a good description and then also utilizing keywords, but also using keywords for your channel. And if you've got a Gmail account, guess what? You've got a YouTube account, Okay. Facebook Live's okay. You're posting videos to Facebook. It's only going to give you like a 24 to maybe a 40-hour lifespan because there's so much being posted there. It gets you buried down. People don't necessarily go to Facebook to watch videos, okay? LinkedIn Live, that's another feature. It's gonna, It works really well with short videos, longer form video too. People, LinkedIn's really prioritizing that. And like I say, most of, a lot of what we do, especially our short form video, we use the phone. This is a good video camera and a good mic. It's literally just kind of doing a selfie. The, the video I posted this morning across social media, I literally just flipped it around, hit record, and shared, hey, I got a class. You want to join us or something like that? You know, short videos may get 40 to a couple hundred views on YouTube. It depends. We had some that have gotten multiple thousand views on different platforms. The idea is everywhere you post, it's like fishing, okay? If you just post one thing, it's like fishing once in a while. But if I come next to you, and I'm trying to catch the same fish. Who's going to have better luck? The guy with one line in the water or get somebody cast in a net that covers 50 places or 40 places or even five spaces. If I'm doing it in five places, you're doing it just once. I've got a you know five times greater chance of landing an investor or landing a deal. Okay. You can't do business as you used to do back in, in the 2020s. You can't do it like some of you are doing it like back in the 1980s still or 1990s. You know, Scott's here trying to beam you up and I'm giving her all she's got captain to help you come into the new year. And it's gotten so much easier. I mean, you can hire a VA, a virtual assistant to do most of the stuff for you to get rock and roll and help you do some stuff. Now we believe in something called the marketing octagon or the content spider where you create something and you share it across multiple platforms, photos, videos, stories do best when you share, especially as an investor, 
We use Buffer to sh share it and post it at the correct times across multiple platforms. All I have to do is upload it once, schedule it, and then it goes out when we want it to. Well, if I'm at work or traveling, it goes up. Not everyone is on every platform. That's why you post to multiple platforms, okay? Cross promotion is like that cast in that you're going to get more hits and you're working multiple algorithms against each other or with each other to help you maximize your engagement. The best time to post things are usually at lunch, 3 p.m., 7 p.m., or 9 p.m. Later in the day, because people are on their phones killing some time in between commercials or sitting or waiting. Okay. And here's the thing start with one new thing each week. Start something, start posting, start posting to Twitter, start posting to YouTube. You're not going to see immediate impact if you post and stick to it over time. It will help you. Because here's the thing, you're going to be an investor for a long time. Can we agree to that? If you don't change and don't adapt, guess what? You're getting get run over by those that are adapting and changing and applying these techniques to their business. And that's what really separates successful investors from those that are having to go back to work or do something. It's the same thing in, in like real estate or with the realtors or mortgage brokers. Those that were doing business as normal, they're leaving the business to find a job. Those that understand embrace marketing, they have multiple ways of generating income, deal flow, leads, because they've embraced marketing and are using these tools to feed them deal flow. Got to do something different, ladies and gentlemen. Got to do something different. All right. <clears throat> Any questions about that before we, before we move on, ladies and gentlemen? Let's do this. Let's take a uh, let's just take a quick five minute break. I get up, get some more water, and, um, and come on back at twenty five past the hour. All right, cool.
Boom, bop. Boom, boom, bop. Wow, wow. All righty then. Any questions, comments so far from you guys? All right, let's move on. <clears throat> All right, so people often ask me too, Scott, what do we need um, to buy notes? Do we have to have an LLC? Can we fund in our IRA? Uh, yes, we'll go through that right now with your business structure. All right, so how do you structure your note business? Now, the easiest way to do it is you need to use some sort of entity. I prefer a limited liability corporation. You don't need an S corp or a C corp right off the bat. You can use a trust, but here's the thing. You might as well use an LLC. An LLC is going to be easier for you. Um, yes, you can create trust with a piece of paper. I get it. I understand that aspect of stuff, but LLCs are going to be the best for the note business. Okay. Now, you don't need to have one LLC for every note. I would have one LLC for every commercial note you have. All right. And keep that separate. Um, but when you're buying notes, especially residential notes, I wouldn't keep more than a million dollars in in value in one LLC, okay? And people ask, well, I've got an LLC that I use my fix and flip business or my rental business or my hair salon or whatever it is. Can I use that? Yeah, you can. But I think it's best for you to keep the things separate. You don't want something bad happen, like if a bar sues you, you make it, you screw up doing a uh, uh, a fair debt or, you know, when you're starting off, you want to be safer and it's always best to keep your assets separate. All right. And that's why we say that, especially if you've got individual investors, brings money to the table, get more than 250K, put them in a separate entity just for those deals. Um, and same thing, if you're taking assets back and you're buying your own funds, you want to keep those deals in your own LLC separate from the people that you're funding deals with. You want to keep your rental properties in a separate LLC than your note deals. Um, if you have an education or marketing, keep, it, keep that separate. If you've got a separate management company. You want to set up these businesses so that they run independently. Via each other. They can work with each other. But if you don't want something bad to happen, like if a person slips and falls uh, or property catches fire, you don't want somebody going back and suing your LLC and losing everything in an LLC. Okay, It's important to do that. Now, can't I just use my self-directed IRA to buy? Yeah, you can just do that. But it's not smart to fund in your own name or IRA. Why? Because you're going to have people like me reaching out to you to fund deals. Now, that's okay. If you're happy doing that and you want to put that money to work, that's totally fine. Um, I would, though, for asset protection and dealing with the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, I would put the stuff in an LLC or, or create you a self-directed IRA LLC. Some counties like Wayne County, Michigan, are suing self-directed IRA uh, trustees because they're not getting paid. The taxes, it's like Quest, Equitrust, they won't let you fund a deal in their name. You've got to fund it in your IRA, your LLC, because they don't want to get charged for that lack of back taxes, okay? Um, if you're funding or doing a joint venture partnership or something like that, use an LLC. Don't use your IRA and that stuff, especially if you're the one partnering with somebody. Now, if you're funding the thing, it's okay to just use funding with it, and depending on how you want to structure it, securitize your loan, okay? Um Checkbook access in a self-directed IRA is, is, is great. It costs you a little money to set that up. It can be worth it because you have fast access, but you got to be careful and making sure that you're not using that money to go out and like just buy lunch or do something. Make sure it's a qualified expense for the LLC or the IRA. Trust, some people do that. I just don't think, you know, you, oh yeah, I can assign beneficial interest to the trust. Yeah, just use an LLC. Come on, man. Let's be smart. Let's not cut corners here. Because you got a document when you have an LLC, it's just not a trip to the Secretary of State and setting up a tax ID number. You got to start documenting transactions, your your monthly minutes, contracts, joint venture fund agreements, offices, vendors, partnership reimbursements, leases. There's a variety of uh, other decisions. Have you ever seen Aaron Young? And this is where you want to watch the uh, asset protection masterclass that we put on with Aaron Young. He goes through some of the things. It's a two hour video. It's well worth you watching it. To understand all the things you need to do to keep your um, LLC up to date. That's who we recommend is Laughlin Associates, 50 years of, of creating, keeping LLCs up to date to help with asset protection and structuring. They have a corporate bail protection plan. To, if you're doing what they say, they'll help you if you are uh, audited or anything like that. 
they call you monthly to track things and help you document stuff. They've got asset protection plans. They've got a whole uh, they got a whole team of people to help you, not just your LLC, but your whole asset protection strategy with attorneys and accounts, stuff like that. They have a uh, biannual event you call Magnify Your Wealth Summit that if you're a Scott Carson uh, client or student, you get a discount to. So you can check it out, uh, the video of what they talk about when it comes to how they help with corporate bail protection. Go to bit.ly corporate bail protection or sign up for it at courtbailprotection.com. Or you can sign up for the event that they have in, uh, I think it's San Diego now, at, at magnifyyourwealth.com. Okay? But it's important, asset protection, create your LLCs, keeping that stuff separate is one of the most important things for you to do. All right, so session 10 here is to be about exit strategies. And part of that, there's a variety of different ways to make money. This is all about I bought something. What the hell do I do with it now? Okay, how do I make money on this note that I bought? I bought a property. I know I can rent it. I can own or finance it. I can sell it, right? I know I can I turn it into an Airbnb or whatever. I can make money that way, right? What can I do with a note? Well, here's the strategies. Let's dive into it. There's a variety of exit strategies. And I always say there's 10 ways to skin a note. No cat. Meow. 10 ways to skin a note. Now, there is a longer video on this. And I encourage you to go watch that. You didn't know you're going to get like another 10 to 15 hours of education uh, on some of these other videos. But it's included with the note weekend for you so that you can go watch the stuff at your leisure as you structure as you want to and go from there. Okay. But the extra strategy video is longer. It's about an hour long video on that stuff to go for it. But first thing, if you're a note investor and you understand wholesale on a piece of real estate, guess what? You can wholesale a note. You can flip contracts. You can do that all day long if you want to do that. I think that's the least amount of money you're going to make. Wholesalers, you, a, a good wholesaler un understands the asset, understands the profitability and the options and why it's a good deal. Unfortunately, most wholesalers just get in there just throwing shit against the wall. Spaghetti against the wall, see what would stick. You know, they're not doing any due diligence. They're not taking a deeper dive. They're just trying to get anything to work. That's not what you do as a wholesaler. Wholesale, you have to understand. Actually put it under contract in your LLC or your name and then flip the contract, okay? And you can charge 500 plus bucks as a flat fee. You can do a percentage uh, in a point basis, like one to 3% points. If you're uh, flipping a, a performing out, 1% is pretty normal. Non-performing can be two to three points, depending on the percentage. You know, you could do, if it's, um, if you don't know the, the buyer, having de done deals with the buyer, don't trust them, do a double closing, where it's two contracts, your contract from the seller to you, and then you create the same contract from you to the, your buyer with different dates and different amounts, so they can't go behind your back. Uh, if you know the seller, know uh the, you know know the buyer of it and you're friends with them you could just do okay we'll just sign a fee agreement and have them wire you your commission when you close okay you can use a real estate attorney and uh have them create an escrow account for for like 500 bucks where money comes wired in then you're wiring the money out uh and i can't harp on this if you're a wholesaler you're going to make the least amount of money and all the work you're going to put into finding buyers you might as well tweak it and to have them and, and create and find funders for you and you buy the note and keep it in your own portfolio. Now, do I flip notes? Yes, we'll flip notes from time to time. We'll get stuff under contract and we'll flip it for a fee. And stuff that we don't want to buy, we buy in bulk. We've done that, okay? What you have to realize too is the more you look at and more you're buying for your own portfolio or investment, you're going to make more money and you're going to be a better investor. All right? And you're being this long term. If you're just flipping and you're doing this part time, you're not going to be an effective wholesaler when it comes to it. Now, two, if you're buying a note, the first thing your servicing company is going to try to do is they're going to try to reach out and get the bar to start paying on time. And they start reperforming and paying on time. It may be, um, maybe you need to give them a little bit of, of a payment plan. We'll talk about that later on. But you need a licensed servicer to do this. You don't need to be reaching out to the borrowers, like I said, because some states require to be um, a licensed debt collector. Your servicer is going to do that, collection of payments, uh, do the borrow outreach, uh, borrow outreach for right party contact. That's what RPC stands for, is right party contact. You instruct a servicer, all right? 
Um, if you want them to get, start making payment or pay a little bit extra, get caught back up or what kind of plans you're willing to work out. We'll get that later on. Okay. Um, you could do a loan forbearance agreement like a lot of people did during COVID where they just put the year or two they're behind and put on the face final loan if they can start paying on time. But that's the first thing besides wholesaling is can we get them to start paying? Second thing, really it's third strategy besides wholesaling, would be do we need to do some sort of modification or trial payment plan? Now, trial payment plan is what we're going to do for 12 months before we do a loan modification. When you modify the loan, that's changing the terms of the deal. Now, you don't need an RMLO to modify a loan. You don't have to have them requalify. All right. This is why we buy existing loans, because they were already Dodd-Frank compliant and they were good paper then. It's still good paper. You can still adjust some things because the borrower is going to sign off on, on the modification. Okay. Um, we do a trial payment plan, which will be six to 12 months of them making their existing payment and some extra payments. We may uh, entice them. So if they pay for every hundred dollars extra you pay, we'll forgive a hundred bucks. Okay. Usually do these over six to 12 months. And the borrower's got to follow through on what they have to do for six to 12 months before we'll do any type of loan forgiveness. Okay. You can adjust the balance, forgive, reduce back payments, just the payment schedule. If you go straight to a loan modification, it's going to be a short-term capital gain because the IRS is going to want to tax you on the modified amount. Well, if you don't get the modified amount in any type of thing, you're paying tax on something you haven't received yet. It's stupid. But also doing a loan modification restarts the default time frame. So if you modify the loan, now the clock starts over. They could be late again. Uh, you know, This is why we want them to pay six to 12 months. They're only like 90 days, 120 days behind. Don't do a modification. Just make your existing payment and pay a third extra to get back on track or a fourth extra to get back on track by four months. Simple, okay? Um, the borrowers are going to need to sign on a trial payment plan and loan fund modification. Your servicer or attorney will create those. When we buy a portfolio of notes, we, we know kind of after our due diligence and looking at things, what route we want to go with a borrower. Can they do this, this, or this? Okay, so here's A, B, or C. We'll send that to the servicing company once we close and fund. And it'll take them two weeks to a month to make right party contact with the borrowers the first time because they got to wait for servicing to be transferred anyway. But the servicer works for you, and that kind of helps us speed up the aspect, okay? Number four is the seller pays you off. They come to the table, and they pay off the loan, all right? You could agree to do like a, uh, a settlement, a reduced settlement payoff. You do a payment plan. Maybe they pay off a loan for 90 days and three lump sums. You're, here's the thing. If if the existing lender has been reporting these late pays to credit, you don't have to report them to credit. But if they have, guess what? They're not going to go out and get a note. You have to tell them on the phone, like, this has been reported to your credit. This is a personal loan. You're not going to be able to get a loan. Now, if you got cash or relatives, if it's your primary residence, you're not going to be able to go get a hard money loan. Okay, no, no harm in loans to give it because they don't want you to file bankruptcy, drag it all out. So it's going to be cash, you know, cash out their 401k or other things. Okay. If it's an investment property, now they might be able to go get a DSCR loan or go get a uh, hard money loan for the investment property. There's also um, some government programs out there that they'll pay money towards the, the rearages and some stuff like that. Uh, same thing when you're asking people, ask the servicer to ask, and the servicer should ask me, what do you have as far as? financials. Now, here's the thing. I hate, I don't want to send out a, a financial document. I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to send it out, mail it out to them. And it takes two weeks for that, two weeks to get back to me, or they may not get back to me. I want the servicer to collect this information on the phone. Just give me rough balls of what it is. Uh, you can send a scan, you can send me a scan copy, of retirement account, so you know where you're at. They won't send any of that stuff. They're not going to, they're not going to tell you on the phone. You can come up with a rough what, what they can't afford, what they can't afford on the phone. It doesn't need to take a month to get financials in. Okay, can you start making payments? Can you pay a little bit extra? Great. Can you bring some money to the table? Yes or no? These are all three questions that can be answered pretty fast. We can't do that to get back on track. Then we need to look to either can you pay me off or do we need to sell it, sell it off? Okay. Uh, do you have somebody that can make takeover payments? Do a loan assumption is another way that you can make money, get the bar back on track. Yes, you can allow someone to take over payments. I mean, I could let somebody assume my loan or take over uh, the property subject to if I'm behind in something, family member, a friend, maybe a potential investor to take it over. We have them fill out a 1003 or loan qualification form just to make sure that they can make the payments. You're not refinancing the loan. 
Okay, it's the same term, so there's no MLO required. Same terms as before. We're not modifying the loan. Okay. You want better terms, and guess what? Refinance is out. Okay. We're not forgiven. If you're going to take it over, you get the existing stuff. Okay. The borrower can quit claim it to the note payer and get rock and roll. Okay. Now, if you don't have something to take it over, can't pay us off the loan, then we can agree to do a short sale. Okay. Uh, this is where the borrower, uh, with the approval of the bank, sells the property at amount below the payoff, or that's where the short is. Okay. So I, the bank, have to approve the short. Okay. Now, there's some things about that. If a bar can make payments and it's in a market that can lose some stuff, we, we can't agree to a short sale. Let's say they owe 120 and the house only worth 100. Okay. Well, we tell the bars, okay. Um, can't make payments, can't get back on track. Let's just, you know, your husband's moved on or your wife's moved on. You can't afford the house themselves. Um, we'll let you sell the property. Let's try to sell the property. So you've got, you know, 30 days to try to get something under contract. Okay. And we'll tell you, like, have the realtor listed at 85% of fair market value. So in our situation, they owed 120 the houses only worth 100. So I tell them to list it at 85, provided I bought the note less than 85 substantially, right? Okay. Because I got to make money between... The payoff. Now, if I the reason we listed at eighty five percent of fair market value is so it's a multiple offer situation. You got to get put some equity, get people enticed. If you just say pull price at full hundred and they see third party approval required, nobody's going to come and walk at it because they don't want to wait you know thirty, sixty, ninety days to get approval from a bank for another thirty day payoff. We're the fastest short sale negotiation company in the world because we can have an answer in less than twenty four hours, four hours sometimes. And the idea here is that the reason we listed 85%, so it's a multiple offer situation, we're actually accepting less um, of a short because people will bid it up. Okay, so the 80, 85,000, 90, 95, okay, we're, we're forgiving 25 versus 35, okay? Um, here's the thing. If there's no booking or showing appointments um, within a two-week period, we know it's going to go more of a deed loan. That's the next step. We also do not let the realtor book appointments around the schedule of the borrower. The, the house has got to be available at any given time. All right? Not at one hour at night, not when the borrower is home. No, no, no. It's got to be available at any time. If they want to agree to that, then we're going to go to either a deed loan or foreclose. Okay? Um, we're also going to ask both realtors to reduce their commissions to 4% because if we're going to bleed, everybody's going to bleed. Okay? If there's no showings in two weeks, like I said, nobody's coming in and looking at even at 85%, then it makes sense just to go ahead and do a deed and loot cash for keys and move on. We'll give you five grand to walk, deed the property. And this is, of course, if there's no other liens on the property that we can't wipe out. If there are liens on the property, then we do a consent for judgment and we'll go to the foreclosure, okay? Um, now I could 1099 the borrower for the short to write off my tax is a nice tax uh, write off for us. But it's also incentive, like, listen, getting the borrower to play ball with us. They can, if they've got, if they're, um, oh, what do we call it? What's the word? If they have more going out than what they have coming in, insolvent, we send them a 1099. They can just file, a, I think it's an IRS form 928 um, to show that they're insolvent and they don't have to pay taxes on that money. But it's a write off for us. It's one of the key features, key tax benefits of forgiving debt or letting people walk is to write off what they uh, what didn't get paid. Okay. Um, and, and like I said, we're the bank, we can approve it. They can close in 30 days. We'll take a, we'll take a short off of what's owed, but we we're still going to make money. If we bought that note, you know, they owe 120, it's worth hundred, probably bought it at 50. If we can sell it at 85, 90, we're probably going to net somewhere around 30, 35,000 for closing costs, stuff like that. That's still a good day for us. It's still a really good return. Okay. But they can't do that. Then we'll do a deed and loot cash for keys or, or if they've already moved out of the property, sign the property over to us. We'll let the borrower walk scot-free, basically. They'll deed the property back to us. The big thing about this, we're going to make sure we need to get interior access. We need to look at the condition of the property. Is it in good shape? All right. Is it clean? We're not, if it's trashed out, guess what? We're going to foreclose and go after them for it. Okay. Um, Something, they need to get stuff out. They need to leave. They move out of the property. We'll forgive them the debt. They'll do a deed and loan cash for keys and not go after a foreclosure for them. And it starts anywhere from 500 to 1,000, and it's to expedite taking the property back. So if it's like, I'll give you an example. We bought stuff in Florida. Instead of going through a year-long plus process to foreclose, we'll give you five grand to walk, because that's what's going to cost us roughly. I and mean, we've done up to 10 grand before because we bought notes that had a ton of equity. 
It just made sense. We had another one we were offered five grand, but the lady owed four grand in back taxes, so we only gave her a grand. She was happy with that. Okay. House has got to be clean swept. It's not going to be perfect. We're not going to paint and carpet. I mean, we've had some of that, um, but it avoids a foreclosure on the credit. That's a very big thing because if it forecloses, that's seven years on the credit versus late pays being just two years. Okay. Always got to check the credit. I mean, always got to check the title. What other liens are out there? Um, liens are, can you get paid? Can you get them removed? Can you reduce? There's different things out there. If there are liens like a second mortgage, then you would do a consent to judgment or a cash for consent. And that's to show the judge that you're foreclosing on the hay. Borrowers agreed to this judgment. Let's foreclose and wipe out the second and expedites that. Okay. Always take pull title and always take internal photos. Call your agent in that neck of the woods to go out there, meet the borrower uh, to collect the keys or take photos, see what kind of surprises you have inside. Now, here's the thing. If you got to foreclose, you take a consent to judgment. The reason you're seeing a realtor out there is to get the keys, but also see what kind of condition it's in. What kind of repairs can you do while you're going through the foreclosure process? There's been times bars have given us the keys and walked, and while we were finishing the foreclosure process, we cleaned the property up a little bit, right? And depending on the situation, sometimes we'll do that. Sometimes we won't. If it's in pretty good condition, we won't. If we're planning to sell at the auction, we're at a price where we can move it at auction pretty good, we'll leave it be. But if we know we're going to end up taking it back and we know we can get a better bang for a buck, and we might fix it up, we might not. It just varies, okay? Uh, if you're buying a note and you're not happy with the bar, the bar is playing tricks or games, dragging stuff out, you could always sell the asset to another investor, okay? With you working through that deal, whether it's three months or six months, and you've had a servicer on there, or had the servicer talking, have your attorney start the foreclosure, you've added value in knowing which way the exit will go. Um. We'll sell assets off that are in longer foreclosure time frame states where there's trouble bar where somebody local can have it. Uh, many funds, here's a great thing. A lot of these funds that are buying portfolios of distressed debt, their goal in the first 90 days is when they buy a portfolio non performing, is to reach out to the bars in the first 90 days. Remember, it's going to take two weeks to 30 days for servicing transfer to take place. And they're going to immediately start reaching out to these bars and say, listen, you want to modify, start paying, let's work to get you back on track. Beyond 90 days, they don't necessarily want to go through the foreclosure process. They'll look to start selling those assets off at a 10 to 15% market. So they're making a decent annualized return. But still leaving some meat in the bone. Okay. If they get a 10% return uh, above their purchase price to do that in 90 days, that's like a 40% annualized return for them. It's a good thing. When we sell, we'll do this sometimes. So the local investors will market via local meetup groups, real estate clubs, um, LinkedIn, uh, you know, hey, real estate, Georgia real estate investors, or hey, Florida, we've got a deal for you, okay? There's a handyman special, as Ron LeGrand's known, famous for doing that, and sometimes we've done that before. Um, but we'll also reach out to investor-friendly realtors who have um, investors in their pocket, and it could be a potential deal for them to take off our hands as well. Number nine, we don't like to do this, but we still end up doing about 25% of the time. It's foreclosing. <clears throat> Remember we talked about a, a nausea to foreclosure is going to be faster, cheaper, about a thousand bucks to foreclose. A judicial foreclosure, got to go through the judicial process of that state, and that varies anywhere from six months to a couple of years. And this would be anywhere from an average, a minimum 2,500, if not usually to be about 5,000 or more. Um, you can, you'll can you take it to the foreclosure auction. You control the bid at the auction. Okay, So you tell the attorney or your crier on the county steps of what you want to accept. Now, they're usually going to start it at zero or 100 bucks and work their way up. But if it gets to like you tell them like we're happy at 80 and it gets bid up beyond 980 just to let, agree not bid it up anymore okay and we've for, used foreclosure auctions to bid up assets to sell it at the auction if it's an asset we knew we could take back you know if we wanted to own an asset in a specific area and keep it we would just if they owe more than the property's worth we just make the, the opening bid the payoff amount and that's not it's not going to sell so we're not going to overpay at the auction most of the time they do hey kudos congratulations you own this asset it's not worth that but thank you for the payoff okay um, if it's not sold, then you take the property back and then fix it up, keep it, clean it, whatever you want to do. Okay. The foreclosure is basically going to clean the title. Now it may not clean out all the water liens and water bills. Those will sometimes follow. Um, if there's back taxes though, guess what? You got to pay the back taxes to clean up that title. Um, if it's a tax sale that can wipe out your note, you gotta be careful about that. So that's why we often will pay taxes off, um, at the auction or before. If the if taxes are outstanding and it sells at the auction uh, for 90 and there's five grand back taxes, that the tax bill is going to get paid there at the auction. Okay. 
If you take back the asset, make sure you do yourself a favor and place a lien on the property for the funding investor that also is there to protect your asset. It's because there are people out there who are unscrupulously targeting foreclosure auctions and slapping fake liens on properties with the hope that you're going to pay off that lien instead of waiting another 90 days to clean it off. So you got to be careful. That's why putting a lien on a property will protect the equity, especially if you got a ton of equity assets, make sure you have your attorney slap on a, a friendly lien to, to protect the uh, protect your equity. It's one of the most important things. Now, 10 goes back to really number two. If you get the bar back on track and they're paying for six to 12 months, guess what? That's now reclassified as a performing note or reperforming. You can sell that reperforming note out for cash flow. Uh, and so there's a lot of people out there looking for performing notes or reperforming notes. If you got six to 12 months of on time payments on a regular basis with a third party servicer and you approve that stuff, you can sell that at 80, 90 cents on the dollar of UPB or payoff, depending on that. Okay. Don't service these loans yourself. It reduces your value because you have no clean way to basically track payments in a lot of cases. Use a third party servicer. Now you can only sell off if the, if the borrower's been making principal and interest plus, plus extra, you're going to sell this off the basic P&I payment, not the modified payment, okay? Or the extra they were paying. And you're only going to sell it off the UPB, not usually off of legal for the most part. It just doesn't work that way. I know so many people try to do that and it just doesn't do that, okay? A bar may still be behind, but if they paid six to 12 months behind, guess what? They're reperforming, you know, they're paying off that back payment, but that consistency of payments works in your favor, okay? Number 11, some people get scared of bankruptcy. If you're a traditional real estate investor, you don't like bankruptcy deals because you don't you're not getting the actual property. But with us, bankruptcy works in our favor. Okay. It's either going to be a chapter 13, which is going to be a 60-month payment plan. You can look at um, or restructuring them out of paying off the back payments. If you see that it's a, a BK loan, you can always check by going to pacer.gov and looking for the BK report on that one. You need a, a bankruptcy attorney, your servicer can help you with that to collect on your behalf. It's basically a five-year payment stream. Uh, you also have the right to approve the payment or not approve the payment if it's a bad payment plan. Like if their payment's $800 a month, they come back, well, we can only afford $50 a month. Yeah, no, that doesn't make any sense. Let's just go ahead and have you deed the property back to us, okay? But BK loans that are paying are highly sought after by a lot of funds because it's a payment stream. They like that, okay? Um, you can also have them discharge the mortgage if the payment plan fails. Or if they're paying the mortgage on time, they're filing bankruptcy for medical bills or credit cards, something like that. You can always have them remove the mortgage from the bankruptcy filing and just keep paying on time. Okay. Um, if you started the foreclosure process, a BK will stop it. And if you go through BK chapter 13, great. They're making payments. If they stop paying, guess what? You can have that uh, kicked out of bankruptcy and then you restart the foreclosure or finish the foreclosure. You don't have to start all over again. Okay, BK Chapter 7 is basically a liquidation of the debt. Um, and basically, they're deeding the property over to you, or you're basically foreclosing. It's becoming an REO. It's not, some people think they can keep the house. That's not the way it works. Okay. It deed loan foreclosure if the borrower does not comply. We go from there. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns about the different exit strategies, different ways we're making money when it comes to what the hell do I do with this note when I bought something? <laughs> All right, let's move on. All right, let's see. I'm just making sure everything's going well on the live stream real fast. Oops. Yeah, okay, good. Now, one of the things that overwhelms people a lot of times, and I think I mentioned this earlier on, is when you are marketing to banks and asset managers, whether it's with LinkedIn or email or somebody calls you up with a list, you're going to get a spreadsheet. It's, we call that a tape, okay? That can be overwhelming. And it may be 100 notes, it may be 500, it might be five, whatever, okay? There are some things you have to look at to realize that you determine if it's a deal or a dud. Now, here's the number one thing. 
Not every asset on there is a deal. I've seen realtors have breakdowns and spend less time trying to target everything on that list. Everything on that list is not a deal. The pricing doesn't make sense or what the payments are don't make sense or where it's located or the condition. A lot of duds, you, you make your money by finding the deals, depending on where you're at, what you're looking for your own portfolio. Well, there are some things you need to keep in mind to consider that can help you sway one way or another in a lot of cases, okay? So the things to consider before buying. One of the things when you're making offers is, especially if you're, you're making some offers and you're doing your do, initial due diligence, look at the servicing notes. Has the borrower been responsive and calling in or has it been the bank calling or has the seller told the bank to pound sand or go F off? That's the case you see. If they're friendly, great. If they're not friendly, guess what? You're going to probably have to foreclose. Look at the payment history. What, what caused the borrower to miss payments or get back on track or they made a lump sum payment? What's the story behind the story? Obviously, market values are changing in the market right now. They're going up. They're going down. The same thing with days on market. Stick to stuff that's got 120 days on market or less. I know that's changing now in the last year. But just because the property is worth $500,000 doesn't mean it's worth that if it takes 100 days, 180 days to sell. What's your 30-day sale price? That's what you have to keep in mind. Okay? Are there any repairs needed? There's always going to be some repairs needed, but is it heavier than not? And you got to realize, too, you're not always going to end to your condition or end to your inspections on an occupied asset. You're not going to get that on a vacant asset a lot of times. That's why we like occupied assets because usually less repairs are needed because somebody's limited to taking care of the property. We'll look at the foreclosure time frames of that state. How far along have they started? Have they begun it? Or are they near the end of it? Okay. Look at the neighborhood variables. Is it a good neighborhood, a bad neighborhood, way the heck out of town? Is there crime? Um, we'll get zoning violations of that property. Is the grass too tall? Um, is there a, a structure next to it or on it that needs to be fixed or taken away? You know, city government issues, are they friendly to making things happen? Or is it like uh, um, Chicago where it takes forever to foreclose or they're just corrupt? Obviously, crime map. Look at the size and population of the cities. Obviously, extra conditioning asset makes a lot of sense. Is there a blue tarp on top of the roof? Is the uh, lawn mode, or is it like Jumanji in the backyards? Rural location, we talked about this. How far outside of town is it, and what's it on? And that also depends on if you're comfortable with something that's on land. Some people can be, some others aren't. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, we've got a, a town east of here, in Austin, or east of Austin, here called Smithville, okay? I wouldn't mind owning Smithville. It's a bit of a smaller town, but if I can find something out there in a couple acres, heck, that would be great. You'd be a little ranchita, all right? I wouldn't mind living there. I can get internet there. That's something I would look at. So I'm comfortable with that, but are you comfortable with that? And one of the most important thing I think is look at local colleges. Is there a local college in that city? If there is, that works in your favor. If there's not a local college or something, then you may not want to do it because if worst case you take is rental, I like uh, to put students in there and get a higher rent rate if it's close to university, okay? Especially like an example, like South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, Indiana is home of Notre Dame, right? Touchdown Jesus over there. Well, if you can buy something within like a mile of the university, that becomes an ideal uh, rental for the students there, not only at Notre Dame, but St. Mary's College, which is right across the way. Or if it's a decent spot, maybe you could turn it into an Airbnb or a weekend rental for home games, home basketball, home football games, which can increase your profits, okay? Just got to be careful what's going on and what's going on. Make sure there's not too much of that, um, you know, gluttoning up the market. Does your asset meet your strategy was the most important thing. Is it going to provide cash flow when it becomes uh, pre-performing or is it providing enough cash flow as a performing asset? Um, if I have to foreclose, am I going to get a big enough check with it by doing a deed and or cash for keys or if we sell it as an REO? If I have other assets in the area, is it going to be a good addition to my rental portfolio? Or if I own or finance it, will it make sense? You know, we have to hold it for a while. We don't have to deal with any work. You want to avoid weird assets and unfinished projects. Okay. I get people, oh, can you finish this project? I don't want an unfinished project. I don't want an, a shell. It doesn't make sense to do. I don't want some weird ass looking house. I want something that's cookie cutter, steak and potatoes kind of basic. Okay. But does the asset have three profitable strategies? Okay. First one. Get reperforming cash flow. Does it make sense for you to be profitable on that where it's paying your investor a good return plus paying you at least equal to what you're paying your investor? Two, we deed loo 
Well, that makes sense to do that. If we can do that and get it up and move to six months. Well, it makes sense. We have to foreclose on this asset. Okay. And it takes us a year to foreclose and fix it up and then sell it. Those are the three most important things. Other things you do after you take the asset back, that's on you. I will not instruct you what you need to do. Okay. All right. D, rental or new. I don't like owner financing properties we've taken back. It ties up the equity types of the, the asset. You might as well sell it and get your cash in as provided a year. It might make sense for you to do that is turn it into a rental where you're holding on the asset for a year. And it all depends on what your existing portfolio is there. So you're not seeing a long-term or short-term capital gains. And then you can also, you know, depending on what your portfolio is, you've got that cost segregation and write-offs that you have with real estate. So you're going to end up owning real estate as a note investor. It's just a fact, the truth of the, of the thing being, okay? Always look as the legal started. Ask to speak to the attorney. Someone will let you speak to the attorney. And then I'm like, well, if you're not letting me speak to the attorney or the attorney's not going to advise me where they're at in the process or what's going on, I'm moving on, Okay. The lender can let you speak to the attorney. Some I, Somebody balk at me the other day. I'm like, no, 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 I have the right to do that. You need to tell me where it's at. I'm not going to say here, you tell me one thing, trust but verify, okay? Look at the servicing notes and the collateral file for hardship letters, background of the borrower. I mean, that's will tell you what the borrower wants to do more than anything else. They send in a hardship letter and they want to try to stay in the property. They'll often outline what they can afford. And that's a slam dunk to getting things, okay? Check the bankruptcy may have already filed. There may already be money sitting at the trustee waiting to be paid to the servicer on your behalf. Look also at the statute of limitations. This is a deal we were looking at with one of my students uh, yesterday or the day before. He was looking at buying a note in Maine. Borrower had made a mortgage payment in 10 years. Well, Maine has a statute of limitations, which is six years, which that means you can only go after the most recent six years of payments. Can't go to the full 10 years. So, did, so the lender was showing as this huge payoff which is 10 years of back payments. Well, that's not accurate. The true payoff is a whole lot less, a third less. So difference in the bidding. Some states offer a safe harbor filing, like a Florida, Colorado, Nevada, three states that offer safe harbor. Whereas um, what that means is basically if people aren't paying their mortgage, they're often probably not paying their ta their uh, condo association HOA fees. So these some of these organizations have these huge fees they get on top of the mortgage. Well, safe harbor Basically, means if you're buying the note and then foreclosing, you only have to pay either one year uh, of the HOA fees or 1% of the sales price. It's a little bit different. Like Colorado might be six months. Nevada is a little bit different because the HOA has the right to foreclose and wipe out the first lien. It's weird in Nevada. But you got to know Safe Harbor for those states. Florida has been great. We, we I'm not worried about the HOA fees because we'll buy the first lien, foreclose, and we're only paying 1%. Sometimes we'll pay a little bit more to the HOA to expedite it and to drag it out in some, in some cases, especially if the borrower um, is willing to do a deed or consent to judgment. All right. But those are some of the things to keep in mind to look at when you're looking at assets and you're, you're going to miss some of those things. Okay. This is why it's important to have a coach or somebody to reach out to that can help answer those questions for you. And that's what we're here for, especially with our WCN membership or those that are going through our one-on-one -on -one coaching. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> All right, what's important, and I talked about deals or duds first before more of the note due diligence, because I want you to keep those things in mind. A lot of things we're going to go through in the note due diligence side here are going to make sense. It's the things that be, is it a deal or dud? Just because you look at a spreadsheet, we often will get bogged down and looking at numbers, or we start looking at property pictures, and you get you'll get lost. Focus on the numbers, focus on the spreadsheet, make sure those numbers make sense first for you before you start diving in and looking at how pretty the asset is or you get uh fall in love with location. The due diligence, you've got the borrower, the property, and the collateral file. You got three things you're doing due diligence on. Okay. We did a longer due diligence video. So I encourage you to go watch it, bit.ly slash note due diligence. Um, it, it does a deeper dive on the due diligence process, okay? We've also did a due diligence masterclass for you that you can spend a whole day where we go through start to finish everything we did, looked at the collateral file, everything we pulled on a particular asset that was a little bit tricky, but I think you'll enjoy. Um, that's in our WC and membership gets access to that, okay? The borrower to do those. You're going to look at the servicing notes. We talked about that. See how responsible they are. If there's any right party contact, 
or they've been a pain in the ass and causing trouble. You're going to look at the previous loan documents, their loan application, the financial documents they submitted, what do they have as far as other real estate, 401ks, retirement accounts. You can jump on pacer.gov if they filed bankruptcy to look at that. We're going to do a little bit of skip tracing by going to whitepages.com or Spokio to make sure we've got a current phone number or address for the borrower or the borrower's family. We're going to look at social media. Yes, we're going to do some social sleuthing on Facebook, LinkedIn to see if they have a profile on there, see if they're posting. Sometimes we found uh, they shared way too much information on Facebook that we're able to make a, a decision on whether to keep them in the house or foreclose or modify in some sort of fashion. We're also looking for neighbors and family members. We also use... Um, um, whitepages.com, especially for buying commercial asset to find phone numbers for like multifamily or RV parks, stuff like that. And that's worked well for us getting a little due diligence on the actual property by talking to some of the tenants by like, hey, we're trying to track down the property manager. How do you like living there? And then they go on and on. You know, we don't tell them we're buying the note, but we did to say, try to track down the property manager. And that's a great way to do it. Okay. And then also we look at their loan application for past or present employees. This came in really handy during COVID. People say they weren't working. They were laid off. Well, we call the employer and find out they're not laid off. They're still working. Okay. So that, that changes the things up a little bit. Okay. The property, obviously, this is kind of your look at values, online value versus in-person. As is value versus your 30-day quick sale price is always important. You're going to talk with realtors to pull a CMA or you're going to order a BPO. Um, if you're happy with the value of the property online because it's a current value, current photos, then all we might do is order a, just a drive-by and exterior inspection to get a quick number, see what it looks like. Look at the market conditions, days on market. Obviously, the market's changed in the last year with interest rates going up. But always, always, always put eyes on the asset before funding. Make sure you take a picture of the street address. So important. We've had realtors go out and take quick photos of good-looking properties because they didn't pay attention to the street number and the actual note was actually the shanty next to it, okay? Look at recent nearby sales and comps. You can't trust Zillow for this. Zillow's only gonna show recent comps. You're gonna see if it's distressed or rehab stuff. So you gotta be careful about your online values. Uh, like I said, we like to uh, order a, a, a BPO. You can get a CMA if you got another local realtor. You can also use an AVM model by using like um, NARRPR.com. Look at your taxes. What's owed on the taxes? Call the county. Ask them. Hey, we see there's only a grand. Is that all it's owed? Is there an upcoming tax sale anytime soon? Talk to the code enforcement company. Hey, what would we need to do to get the code enforcement liens removed or reduced? Okay. Neighborhood activity is a good spot. Uh, has there been a previous MLS listing in the last year or two? That tells you if the seller was trying to sell it. Or if they were trying to rent the property. We found interior photos from those that have that worked out really, especially short sales. If it's listed for a short sale, you can often get into your inspection or have somebody go look at the interior and that gives you a lot of great due diligence on it. Look at their rent rates in case you end up taking it back or look at what's going on. HOA or COA elimination. This is very important. Sometimes, like down in Florida, there's some great places, but you maybe need to be 55 plus to live in the area. Or if you're taking a condo back in some areas, they won't let you rent it out. You've got to turn around and, and only owner occupants can live there. Or some places that are off of golf courses, you got to pay a fifteen dollars to $50,000 membership fee to be a part of that H, that uh, apartment complex, I mean, a part of that uh, community, okay? Are there any special assessments that the HOA is starting to charge to update the grounds or update the elevators, the exterior conditions, stuff like that, okay? And of course, the crime map. Sometimes it makes sense to pick up and call uh, the substations and, and find out condition report of what's going on in an area, zip code, area, talk to an area, cop. Is this a good area? Is it a bad area? Is it a rough area? What's going on with that? More about the property. Here's the thing. Most of the time, you're not going to get interior access to the property. So you're not going to be able to order inspection. Okay. Now, if it's listed for sale, then you get inside. You're still not going to order an inspection report. You're buying the note, not the property. Okay. This is important. This is why you still need to put eyes on it because if the lawn's mowed, power's on, this is why we like to call and uh, call the utility departments to see what's going on. You can use your Zillow values for upfront due diligence, but once your offer is accepted and then you're in the official due diligence period, then you pay for title insurance or not title insurance, a title report and then a broker price opinion to pay for that. Okay. You can use the NARRPR.com if you get a realtor and they're NAR licensed, they're still the NAR. This is a free service for realtors. 
Call the utility department. So is it, you get power on, power off. I'm, I represent the bank. You have a vested interest in the property. They're going to give you more information if you're just calling to talk about the property, okay? If you find that the bid comes back below value, there's more taxes that weren't showing, the condition report, you can always fade your bid or cancel your bid. This stuff comes back. But always, always, always have somebody put eyes on the asset, okay? Now, when it comes to collateral due diligence, you want to look at the original loan docs or the mortgage. You're not going to get this sent to you on the front end. This comes after you close, but you get scanned copies, PDF copies, of this. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, never find until you've looked at the collateral file. If somebody tells you they'll send you the collateral file after you find, screw that. Don't deal with that. In the collateral file, you need to make sure that there's a chain of assignment. So like when a property sells, there's a deed transfer, right? When a mortgage sells, there's an assignment transfer. There's an assignment of mortgage. So make sure that there, every time that mortgage has been sold, there's an assignment that goes with it that's been recorded. If it's not recorded, make sure it's in the file folder, okay? And along with assignments is what's a one-page allonge that shows a transfer as well. That doesn't need to be notarized, but the assignment of mortgage does need to be notarized. I won't fund until all the assignments are there. I will fund if I miss an allonge. It's not that big a deal. Look at the deed of trust. Look at previous appraisals if you can find that. You know, Look at the previous borrower's loan application, see what they filled out, what their credit score got, does, what they were doing, anything else they might own. And go after them. Like I said, you're going to get a soft copy, which is PDF copies, electronic copies of the collateral file. Take a look at it. Uh, you'll get the hard physical collateral files 30 to 45 days after you close. If you don't, if they don't send it to you, you need to bark up the tree and say, "Hey, I need to send this." I had one seller we bought a portfolio from. 45 days came. I still have collateral files. They wanted me to fund another portfolio. I was like, no, 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 I don't even have the collateral from these other first ones. I'm not going to fund until I get collateral. Lo and behold, a week later, all the collateral showed up. I was like, okay, now I'll fund. <laughs> all right. But you're doing this, and I know we kind of rushed to that. You're going to learn more from working through your first couple of deals than you will with anything else. Okay. The idea here is to learn the majority of it. And like I said, this is the Cliff Notes version of our three-day class. Is that there's things, you have property, the borrower, and the collateral. File. Those are the three things you're doing due diligence on. Okay. Good stuff. <clears throat> All right. As I said before, and I mentioned this throughout, there's a couple of things. You're not in this business by yourself. Now, I know a lot of people, when you get into real estate investing, you feel like you're the, the guy or the gal that has to do it all. I'm going to go find the property. I'm going to rehab it. I'm going to do all the work myself. And I get so many investors come over like, I want to buy notes and I want to have a conversations with the borrowers because you're used to dealing with distressed property owners. Negative ghost rider, not going to happen. The pattern is full, okay? You're going to use your vendors to do most of the work, especially when it's out of state and out, away from you. You don't want to be rehabbing properties, okay? You're also, if you're working full-time job, you don't want to wait till you get home at night to try not to reach the borrower. You want to be having your vendors and your team of vendors doing the work for you so things are getting rock and roll. You do not want to be the bottleneck in your note business, okay? Your trusted team is going to include quite a few people, a servicing company, and your servicing company is going to give you an asset manager, a, an assigned person to talk to regarding your portfolio. Now, don't call them every day bothering them, you, but you should talk to them at least once a month about your asset and what's going on and what's proceeding, okay? Now, here's the thing. So all servicing companies suck ass in some sort of fashion. Some are really good and some are horrible. And you get what you pay for in a lot of cases. There's a few that I would recommend and a few that I wouldn't recommend. There's a few that I'll buy assets from knowing that the, if they got servicing with one company, that servicing company sucks. I know that, okay, perfect, okay? You can use Madison Management, you can use Covey Financial, Allied Servicing. There's a few that we would recommend that are, will work with one-off investors to get started. And those are your things, okay? S and Servicing will have notes for sale. They're probably the most expensive when it comes to uh, servicing. And so you got to be careful there. They, they can box some stuff up for you. You're going to use a title company uh, to either pull O&E reports. But you got to remember, you're not going to usually close with a title company. Because the title insurance from when the note was created is still in place, okay? Still in place from when it was originated. That's why we like institutional loans, institutional credit stuff, not owner finance stuff. Because sometimes owner finance stuff doesn't have any title insurance on it. 
So we use a vendor to pull O&E ownership and recumbrance reports. It's like your title reports. Okay, so you're going to have a company, that, a vendor you use for that. Uh, Baldwin Advisory Group has a great agreement with a company that allows us to get uh, one-offs, ONI, one-off BPOs. You can go from there. You can also use Pro Title USA. Um, they're okay, but I prefer Baldwin Advisory Group. Your other team, uh, somebody to pull BPOs and valuation. Baldwin Advisory Group is great who we use for pull a broker, a broker price opinion. They can also order a drive-by once a quarter. It's like 40 bucks just to drive-by, take a couple of photos, make sure the property's there in good condition. If you're buying an area that's been hit hard, like with a, a hurricane or flooding, that's good to know because it's a, it's a pretty cheap thing to send somebody out versus your happy ass jumping on a plane, okay? Uh, foreclosure attorneys, you need to have a foreclosure attorney in every state. That's important. Um, your, if you don't have one, your servicer can provide one or you can use third-party referrals from other note investors, okay? But they usually have their own list. If their attorney is not on it, then it's pretty easy to add it to the list, okay? Uh, otherwise, you can jump on like legalleague100.com to find attorneys in states that handle specific things, especially foreclosures and work well with note investors. But I, I like referrals or who my servicing companies are currently using. There are third-party special servicing companies. These are more like aggressive workout companies. There's a few out there. They usually want you to have a, a chunk of notes to work on, not just one note here to work out, but they're going to be much more aggressive. Usually you're going to send like a 90 day contract with them to kind of do the bar route reaching go there. So your law group was one company we've used in the past. There's a few others, uh, coast angels, another company out of the West coast. Um, they come and go. It just varies a little bit, but it's basically you're hiring in like seals team six to go in and really work with the bar in a lot of cases be aggressive. Okay. Whoops. What did I do? Oh, I clicked on the video link. We did opposite. Uh, there we go. Episode 172. That popped up. Wow. Of the note closure show talks about um, special servicing. There you go. Let's go back. <laughs> that link works. Okay, good. All right. Your trusted team is also going to include uh, probably at first, you're probably going to store your collateral files at your house. Make sure it's in a safe of some sort so your kids can't get excited about turning it into uh, you know, paper, your dog doesn't chew it up, your cat doesn't decide to use your file as a litter box. All right. Um, there are companies that will store that for you. Some servicing companies will store it for you, the flat fee per year. Others will store it like a monthly basis to review your collateral file and store the files. Um, you can use Joel Markovitz as a company we use to do collateral file reviews. CSC out of Dallas, usually once you have 100. Richmond Row is probably the best one. They're out of West Branson, Missouri. Casey Wilson and company out of California, they'll do a collateral review and tell you what's missing. It can also help you fix that stuff. Um, realtors, you're going to use realtors. Don't try to pull values and sell the property yourself. Use a realtor. So helpful in pulling accurate comps, giving you an idea of the condition of the property where it's located. Okay, They can tell you, hey, this is a great area, or hey, it's a rough area. Can't find somebody, you don't know somebody, use realtor.com, activebrain.com to find that. And of course, Baldwin Advisory Group has a realtor network, uh, a, re a realtor referral network to find agents across the country as well for you. Okay. Um, you're going to need forced place insurance. And so, property insurance companies are a great way. Ross Diversified Insurance out of Orange County, National REI Group out of Kansas City. You also have property preservation companies. They're companies that go in and winterize a property. I would rely on your realtors to, they usually will have somebody that can go do that for you. Of course, Baldwin Advisory Group, you've heard their name talked about a lot so far. They also have a list of people. So Baldwin Advisory is kind of our one-stop shop when it comes to our vendors and finding people and stuff like that. Dickie's, uh, Dickie Baldwin, who's the founder of Baldwin Advisory, he's got over 40 years, 40 plus years, 43, 44 in the uh, note mortgage investing side of things. We helped them launch Baldwin Advisory Group uh, six years ago during one of our mastermind and just does a really great job. And so you can always go to BaldwinAdvisoryGroup.com, Dickie's phone number and email, reach up on there. Pretty easy to order an O&E and &E, a an BPO or just pick up the phone, give him a phone call. He's a great, he's great to talk to. And you've also can uh, watch the webinar we did with Dickie a little while back by going to that link in uh, the slides here for you. Okay. Questions about uh, vendors, trusted team before we move on here. We're getting close to ending, uh, wrapping this up for the day, guys. So just so, so you know, um, if you have questions, now would be a good time to start putting that in the chat roll for me, okay? <clears throat> so 
So our next session here, guys, session 14, what comes next? Now, what comes next? This has been, I hope you've enjoyed spending the, your Saturday or Sunday if you're watching the replay by me going through and sharing this with you about the kind of the basics, how to find fun and flip and how to, what goes into it. Yes, you're not going to learn everything about note investing. The initial class should not be your only education when it comes to note investing. Now, what are you going to use? You're going to probably use YouTube to find some stuff. You're also going to probably use podcasts. That's great to piecemeal it together. But if you really want to take your business to zero to 60 fast in 60 days versus six months or six years, trying to do it all yourself. And I get some of you guys out there where, where you're tight in funds. And this is all that fits in your budget right now. I get it. That's why we have our uh, WeCloseNotes.tv, our number one YouTube channel. It's why we provide this one-day class for you. It's also why we have the number one podcast with a note closure show for you. Lots of information for you to learn. The idea here, ladies and gentlemen, is you've got to learn and go for it. And that's why we have our three-day workshop upcoming, NoteBuyingForDummies.com. We teach us about four times a year, two times in person, two times via Zoom. We held one in December online and via Zoom, three days. Great information. We cover a lot of the same information, but some people like being in person, networking uh, with other investors. That's great. Totally fine with that. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that uh, there, Jim. He says, how do you spell fire hose? Great stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much for saying that. We're here to give you a lot of information. You know that we, we never slough on the info and the content for you. But our note buying, for, uh, note buying, uh, note buying workshop we call it No Buying for Dummies. And that's where you can register at NoBuyingForDummies.com. We've been teaching this in some sort of fashion. And it has changed over this. Uh, so we started doing this 14 years ago. Started teaching note buying in 2010. First class was 18 people. Right? And that's changed from in-person classes. We've done as small as three all the way up to as big as 150. Okay? Um, doing a lot online. We were doing online virtual classes for years. We've gotten back to the point, hey, let's do an in-person workshop because I know people are like, I'm tired of being on Zoom. I want to get out and network with some people. And that's what we're doing this for. So we have the next class upcoming March 1st, 2nd, 3rd. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's here in Austin, Texas. It's limited to 50 people, okay? We cap it at 50. We're not doing the big ones. We like the small, intimate event where I can talk with everybody. We can have a good time. We can network. Um, one we did in August last year was great. We had uh, we had 45 people. We ended up having like uh, 30 people that showed up. Some people got canceled and stuff happens. That's fine. But it was great. Everybody hanging around, networking, happy hour. Uh, most of us went out to dinner, grabbed Barbie together and visiting. Got a chance to really dive deep into what your focus is. And you're with me basically from 9 to 5 in the class, Friday, Saturday. Sunday we go 9 to 3, 9 to 4, so you guys can head out there for you. But we spend a little time with the after hours. Get a chance to know, get a chance to pick my brain, get a chance to hear and see what you're doing. And then I can recommend things as I know things work well for you. Okay. But like I said, March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, it's normally $9.97. And uh, we've got a special discount for you guys. And here's some of the bonuses. We'll give you the, uh, you sign up today. We'll give you the replays to the December workshop. That's usually $2.99 value separately. That's three days of videos. You can start learning now, not having to wait till March and come to March much more prepared with better questions, okay? We also give you a four-week implementation coaching, group coaching, we've been doing that. We're in through week three of that with the folks that took in December. Week four is this Thursday. You can get the replays of that. It's five or nine value. That's a lot of good stuff going through what you need to implement. Uh, Lawful Associates has given us an a secret, a, a entity secrets class that you get as well. That's $99 value. We'll give you the wholesaling and calling banks workshop master classes we did last year as well for you replay. That's $199 each. We'll give you our 20 by 20 how to find and fund video training. It's a 599 value. People really love that because we go in depth each day for 20 days and one way to find deals and one way to fund deals. Okay. We'll give you a VIP ticket. That's a 399 of the value to our mid year uh, note camp convention that we host with 30 to 40 different speakers over three to four days of live calls, live Zoom calls with them, not rec pre recorded. And we get to replays that to that as well. You also. Uh, special thing, we don't usually do this, but we'll allow you to bring a spouse or business partner along as well at no additional price. It's normally a 997 value. Uh, and then we'll also, what we like to do is bring in a portfolio of notes from our tapes that we get in and give you a chance to bid on those assets. We'll dive into the due diligence on that on the day one, day two, day three, a little bit each day 
that you guys after the event you guys can actually make offers on. And it was one of the great things people liked during our three day class. We actually pulled out case studies and worked through case studies of actual deals we've closed or we're in process of closing with the US. We went through the numbers and allowed for you to really see, okay, what does this make sense? And ask questions about this deal and work through this deal. So that's literally over twenty five and over three thousand dollars in bonuses. That's all included in the cost of the class. If you go to notebuyingfordummies.com, you will not uh, trust me. If you come to class at the end of the day, like Scott, this was the worst thing. I don't think it's for me. I will refund your money back, no questions asked. Oh, let's not forget that you get a 200 plus page manual with contracts, forms, everything along with that as well. Like I said, normally it's 997 per person. If you sign up today, we'll give you 50% off plus the extra uh, spouse or partner. You just have to go to notebuyingfordummies.com, click on the sign up page, fill out for information. Top right code, you'll see a discount code put in there. Type in weekend. It'll show 997 otherwise, but if you put in weekend, all caps, and apply, it should drop it down to the 49850 price for you. And uh, we'll be on the north side of Austin here. If you'd want to fly in Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, you can fly out Sunday night or Monday morning. Um, one of the great things we did the class last time is when we wrapped up about three o'clock, those who hung around, we went to a Mexican dinner and had some margaritas and got a chance to visit the folks and stuff like that too for you. So we'll have some more one-on-one coaching students at it. We're already, since we've, uh, we're already, I think we had, uh, we got 15 to 20 people already signed up for this. Okay. So you definitely don't d- dilly dally on this, get signed up. Nope. Buying for dummies.com. Um, We've had one of the things that people have asked, so do you just do you comp in military or past military? We comp those guys and those gals into our virtual workshop. Unfortunately, we've got some hard costs with printing and rental space, stuff like that. We just can't comp people into the three-day workshop. But we can give you access to replays uh, to the December workshop at no no cost for you guys. You still got to sign up for it, and we'll give you a discount code to be able to access those at no additional cost for you, okay? But once again, that's noweekend.com. It's four ninety eight now. If that's still a bit of a, a stretch for you, that's fine. No problem. We got some opportunities for you to learn note investing in, and spread out your learning costs over time. That's our WCN membership. That's our monthly $97 a month membership. It's the best bang for the buck in the industry. It includes a ticket to the virtual workshop, not the in-person workshop. There is a little bit more of a cost. There's a $250 per person fee for WCN memberships. That's still cheaper than the $498. But you get access to the replays from December. A, a ticket to the note camp. You get a ticket to all of our note weekend trains we host on a monthly basis. All our past replays of our calling banks master class, our wholesaling class, our um, oh my god, raising capital. There's another one. Oh, due diligence class. All of that's included in there. Weekly coaching calls with yours truly on Mondays. Plus, you can schedule a call with me anytime you need uh, on the phone. We can jump on and talk about a deal or two you're working on. Plus, there's special vendor discounts, special discounts to other events that we offer our, our WCN folks, to other events throughout the country. And that's $97 a month. We do require to be signed up for that for six months. You can't sign up for that one month, access everything, and cancel. It just doesn't work that way. If that's the case, we'll charge you your card the rest of the month. But $97 a month is spread to design the, your costs out over um, a year. If you want to sign up for that, and pay for a year in advance. We actually do give you a two month discount. You can sign up for that nine seven, get a full year of access to the WCN crew. If you want to do that, let me know. I'll shoot you a custom link for that as well. But that's good. If you're going to sign up for it on a month to month basis, go to noteumbrella.com. Noteumbrella.com. That's good. And yes, if you've got a business partner, it includes them getting access to that as well, too, for you. So two for one for your spouse or business partner. And we use a base camp group uh, as our message board our portal to share files, share deals, uh, get tapes and we'll provide those to our WCN members. S- samples of case studies, samples of postcards, letters, all that stuff is included for you as part of our membership, okay? So that's really the bang for the buck. And yes, it actually does make sense for you to sign up for the WCN membership, pay the extra 250 and come to Austin. It saves you some money. It's We're here to help you succeed. But if you don't want to sign up for the month of month, then just sign up for the three-day workshop. Trust me, the value's there. And like I said, you should have asked me like at the end of day one, like hey, this hasn't been the most amazing class on notes and how how I sh- truly show you how to find deals and will sh- provide you with ways to build a huge list and make things happen. I'll refund your money back. No questions asked and you can go on your merry way. All right. Um, also, there's some things to think about too. If you like notes, you've been around for a while. Maybe you should think about our uh, our 
a fast track success plan. We go from zero to success fast. That's our one-on-one note coaching program. This is a year long program guys. And this is literally having me in your corner, kicking ass and taking names and helping you get deals done. Okay. Now what's involved with our, our note coaching program. We basically, it's, it's a couple of things. We start off with eight weeks of coaching calls, one-on-one coaching, live coaching calls, yours truly. Cause everybody's a little bit different. You can't do pre-recorded for everybody because not everybody's going to understand. So there's some hand holding along in these eight to eight weeks of coaching calls. We'll do that at the time of the week that works best for your schedule and for my schedule. We go through that eight weeks. Then we have you come in and spend time with me for two days. Yes, two days, Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday with yours truly here in Austin. You fly in, we give you the VIP red carpet treatment. All right, we're going to give you our access to our top 12 hedge fund managers from deals that are sending lists out on a regular basis. Um, we're going to do a six-month follow-up call after the two days. If you need, it's a one-day Zoom day. Where are you at? What are you focused on? People still call me on like a 30-minute phone call basis after the two days. Like, hey, I need some help with this or tweak that. And that's totally fine. Our coaching students are our family, okay? But we're going to work with you until you make your money back. You're going to, we're going to work with you until you close on your first deal at least. Some people have closed on 12 deals in their first eight weeks. Like we had John and Veronica Gore. They're coming out next month for their two-day. They've already closed on 12 notes, all right? Taylor Richards already closed on six or seven notes, okay? Some people are already raising capital. Keith uh, Holland closed on four notes. Uh, Cal Yoon closed on five notes before he got here. I think he already closed on another five more based on what he told me last night. Uh, Larry Hoffman had closed on his first note, and he ended up went on closing on over 100 in his first year. We want to help you, and that's why we're so proud of this. We also give you a list of our asset manager uh, contacts through LinkedIn, email. That's a, that's a million-dollar database here for you. Now, the, co- the cost for coaching is a little bit of investment. It's not free. It's not $9.97. I'll tell you that. But it's worth it. Um, and we can structure that in a couple of different ways to make it affordable for you. It's an investment tuition for our one-on-one coaching. It's twenty five grand. It's good for you plus a partner. Or if you've got a third person, there's an additional fee for that. If we've got to deal with personalities, that's good for you plus a partner. All right. Um, if you want to pay in full, we'll give you a $5,000 discount. Not, you know, five grand off is just 20 if you want to pay in full or pay in 30 days. Okay. Um, if you can't pay in 30 days, you can't pay the full thing, that's fine. We can set up monthly payment plans for you. We'll put a chunk down, we'll finance it for you for a period of time. We also have a third party financing uh, solution too for you, but it's a full year of coaching, helping you take your business to the next level. Like I said, I will work with you as long as you want me to, to make your money back. I will stand behind it. I don't know anybody else's. No, you're not coaching from some hourly employee, some guy on the phone that you never see your gal on the phone. You're working with me. Now I don't do a lot of these per year. Okay. I really kind of limit myself to let you know, 20 students a year. That's what we want to be. That's what I'm comfortable with. We're going to have two or three phone calls where we're still looking at deals and making things happen on our own. All right but we have a 95% success rate with our coaching students. We've got a few folks that came in and they disappeared. We scared them off. Don't know what happened to them. <laughs> We've got a few folks that came in, bought notes and then just disappeared. But we work with people. We've got folks like Catherine Bell, who's made over uh, 150 to 200 grand in notes since she's been around for two years. Um, Matrice Walker, Walters is making money. Derek Elder is making money in notes. Larry Hoffman has made over six figures. I could go on and on and on and on on the folks that we've helped. And, and it's a great thing is I always laugh and chuckle when I see some of these different conferences that pop up and people that are speaking in these conferences. And I laugh at about half of them. They're talking about anything to do with non-performing notes. It's probably pretty likely to have been our, our coaching student, like Jay Tenenbaum from Scottsdale Mortgage, the coach, past coaching student, closed on a couple hundred notes, started with us. Chris Savigny, uh, Dan Deppin. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks out there in the non-performing space that we're very proud of who've done an amazing job in going out and closing deals and they've learned from us and got coached by us because we show you the will and the way to make things happen for you. Like I said, if even you know doing that, there is a third option. If you guys are working at a job, you got a career, um, and you're working, you know, worked there for at least two years, we've got a third party financing option with the uh, with Ease Financial, and they only approve a specific amount of educators in the industry who have a good success rate of working with students. And we're very proud of the fact that we're part of ease. If you've got a two year work history and you got W2s, you make 40 K plus per year, and you've got a 620 FICA score greater, you would probably qualify 
for our third party finance, we're going to paint it as low as like $500 a month or less, depending on what your, your score is. Okay. Now, the great thing about this is there's no proof of payment penalty. So, with people that apply for this and they get, you know, they get approved in literally just a couple of hours. And then you got to, you know, send in the form stuff like that, but you can find out what you're approved for. And guess what? You can sit on a payment plan over 24 to 36 months. So they'll they'll finance it longer than we will. We'll find you on stars for like 12 months. The first payment is not due for 30 days. So you can literally start coaching and learning and making offers before you got to make your first payment into ease. And then we've had people that literally, oh, we closed our first deal. We sold it. We flipped it, whatever. And they paid off their coaching within six months that way. So there's great, great options for you on that. If that's something you'd like to to dive into it's pretty easy you just go to bit.ly slash scott's coach you'll take the checkout the cost for that since it's financing and there's fees that we got to pay that's still a full 25 uh but you know even if you don't qualify for the full 25 well, then maybe you qualify for 15 and that's the case we would be willing to carry financing on the remaining 10 for you so some different options for you whether it's a getting started taking the class is a great spot sign up for our membership or if you really want to take the deep dive, this is what you want to do. And you want to work with me one-on-one -on -one and have us really kick some ass and take some names with you and have me on a weekly basis with you. This is the spot to go. And bit.ly slash Scott's Coaching. That's where you want to look at. That's where you want to be. And we really encourage you to take the opportunity. And like I said, if you have some questions, I'd like to talk more about this and see if it's a fit for you. It's not a fit always for folks. That's fine. At least let's talk. Go to talkwithscottcarson.com. Let's schedule a phone call. If you're ready to make that plunge, you're tired of dealing with toilets, tents, and trash outs, trying to find fix and flips, you're just not finding deals at all, we need to have a, a phone call. Talkwithscottcarson.com. That's talkwithscottcarson.com. Let's talk this week. It's not. I'm not a big high-pitched sales guy or high-pressure salesman. Look, I want to work with people that want to work with me. If you don't, that's fine. No problem. But if you really want to take your note business and close deals and make some money, we need to talk and help you. We can help you do that. So are there any other questions, comments, concerns out there for you? Oh, I forgot. There is one other thing. If you're a seasoned investor already, you've bought a lot of real estate, you're pretty comfortable doing it, you might want to just do a note VIP day. VIP day, we've had a few folks take us up on this. They've got a hectic schedule. They can't do eight weeks of calls. They understand it. They've bought real estate. They need help with like one or two facets. Then we could do a note VIP day. Now, the Vote VIP day is you come in and spend a day in Austin, just one day with me, not two days. One day with me. There's a, a, a We do an hour or two call before you come on with me. There's some things you probably need to do. We can schedule us anytime, Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, it's a full day focused on you and what you need to get done. Uh, it's great for those that are self-starters out there. It's not the, not the 25K. Um, you do have to take the virtual note buying workshop. That's a big requirement. Make sure you have the foundation in place. So we're not spending the day answering questions that you should understand from the workshop. Uh, it's no, it's basically $9.97 per day for you. Okay, it's what it is. Because you got to realize if we're charging $25K for it, uh, it's well worth me coming and spend a day and pouring things into you and stuff like that. So that's right at 10 k for that. If you want to do, I said some folks have done that once, they book another one six months later. That works best for them. We give them stuff to rock and roll. We give them taste to make offers on. We help them with some funding. We help them with ask managers, stuff like that. But that's some of the things that if you're a self-starter and you don't need a lot of hand-holding, this might be a better route for you at just under 10K for you. And you can sign up for that by going to notevipday.com or reach out a call with me. And we don't mind splitting that payment up over two, but you got to be paid in full before you come to Austin on that. So if you need to spread that up over two or three payments, we can do that for you and help you prep for that day and put it on the calendar. So a couple of things there for you. Like I said, three-day class, monthly membership, one-on-one -on -one coaching, or just a VIP a day there. There's some different options for you in different budget marks for you. So any other questions, comments, concerns, guys? Or once again, get signed up for the three-day workshop. If you've not been through that, notebuyingfordummies.com. Use the code WEEKEND to get it for free. But that's really probably the next spot that you guys all should go on your journey as a note investor. Let's take you, learn the nuts, the bolts, the foundation, the, what you really need to do. I've enjoyed teaching this one-day class for you, noteweekend.com, guys. Yes, you can attend again this. We teach this basically every third Saturday uh, of the month. And uh, we're here to help you find success and achieve phenomenal growth and make some phenomenal income here in 2024 and beyond. Any other questions, comments, concerns before we let you go for the day?
All right, everybody. Well, hey, thank you so much for those guys that hung around. Thank you, Newbie. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, uh, Jim. Thank you, everybody who watched on the live stream. If you're watching the replay of this, feel free. Let's book a phone call. Talk with scottcarson.com. Pick a time that works for you, and let's jump on a, a quick phone call and see if we can't help you make some money and knock some things out. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your Saturday, your Sunday, or whenever you're watching this. Take care, everybody.